committee room 30. Stella, can you uh, pick that up there? We are an open now. We're, we're an open, we are an open session, okay, right. Um, okay, I want to advise members then that the, the committee meeting uh, will be uh, recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and indeed online. Uh, members are welcome to use mobile uh, devices as long as they're in airplane mode and devices are muted. Um, okay. So I have no apologies, and in terms of chairperson's business, um, I want to refer members to the correspondence from the Minister at page 5, uh, in which he offers to meet the committee on the 11th of March um, to discuss his priorities. I want to remind members that the meeting on the 11th of March is scheduled to start at 9.30am, as there are three oral evidence sessions scheduled, one of which uh, is with the Department on Operational Issues and EU Exit. Um, in preparation for the end of the uh, grace period. Um, a member is content to schedule the ministerial briefing into the space the department ha already holds that day. And please note that the permanent secretary intends to cover the matter of operational issues and preparation uh, for the end of the grace period at the session today. Members okay with that? So I can advise members that the uh, Westminster is submitting a bid to host events at COP26 and members previously agreed to be involved in this along with other legislators. A draft bid has now been prepared and will be submitted tomorrow and requires a statement of support from the committee. Uh, this will enable representation from the Assembly and this committee once events uh, have been finalised. Um, a member is content that, following, that the following line is added to the bid. This proposal is supported in principle by the NI Ag Assembly Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Okay. Um, there has been a meeting arranged for Monday 15th of March from 2 to half 3 to discuss potential cooperation around COP26 with the following. That's the, the UK uh, BEAS, the NA uh, uh, Assembly Committee, our committee, the Welsh Parliament uh, Climate Change, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, the Scottish Parliament Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, is, is, is okay for the that, that uh, we can represent at that meeting, that myself and the Deputy Chair can represent at that meeting. Okay. Thank you. See your heads all nodding. Uh, so I want to refer members to the draft minutes, the meeting on 25th of February, page six. Uh, can we seek agreement for the minutes? Just nod there if you want. Yeah. And um, I'll sign them whenever I get a chance uh, next week. It should be in Parliament Buildings next week. Um, okay, members, uh, we're going to move on to item five on the agenda. Item five is the update on construction and staffing at the Border Control Ports, ports of Entry. I want to refer members to the briefing papers from the department uh, which has been tabled. And I want to welcome by Starleaf uh, Dennis McMahon, Permanent Secretary, uh, Robert Huey, the Chief Vet, Mark Livingston, uh, Brexit Constituency Planning, and Norman Fulton, uh, head, of, head of Food and Farming Branch. And I want to take the, this opportunity to thank the officials uh, for coming to the committee at short, such short notice. And I note that uh, we have, we didn't, we don't have any written papers, written papers provided, and this is due to the short notice provided to attend this meeting. So um, uh, that's, we just want you to note that there. So I'd like uh, um, at this point, um, Dennis, Robert, Mark and Norman to for you maybe to kick off to to brief the committee on this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Can I just check? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. That's right. great. Thank yeah. you. All yeah. right. Um, so look, um, and and just to say, uh, believe it or not, the the other reason for the the briefing paper, we had the briefing paper prepared early, and we've been doing a, quite a bit of work on that. And I know that's for another day, uh, to make sure that we get briefing papers up to you earlier. Um, but uh, we had an announcement yesterday also, which uh, the minister felt we needed to include in that. So uh, hopefully we'll we'll cover that today anyway in in the verbal brief. Um, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank you, Chair and members of the committee, for the opportunity to provide an update and post EU exit. I thought it would be helpful to elaborate on some of the information that um, well, hopefully uh, you, you'll have seen, but in particular to give you a sense of the scale of work that's been done to date and also the challenges ahead. Um, and I know the committee obviously wishes to understand the position with regard to the Minister's decision on Friday 26th of February 2021 to write to me. 
asking me to halt one work on the development of permanent facilities for sanitary and phytosanitary checks and two charging for SPS checks. Uh, we haven't actually started charging. Um, you know, we're, we're in the process of developing, developing them. With regard to the first issue, the Minister stated the following. Uh, Given the uncertainty, lack of clarity and the ongoing impacts of the protocol to date, I am instructing officials to halt all work re relating to the programme for permanent builds at the ports, recruitment, current and planned of additional portal staff, including vets, and any engagement with DEFRA on the matter. On the second issue, the Minister stated, I'm issuing an instruction to halt all work in relation to OCR charging. The Minister noted that he had raised the second issue with me at a ministerial update meeting on 16th of February, which indeed he had. Um, so the, um, where, where does that leave us? We're in the process of seeking legal advice on these two requests and we'll be briefing the minister accordingly as the next step. And the minister will also wish to engage with executive colleagues. He's done that already and he plans to bring a paper to the executive. Um, we will need to uh, consider all relevant factors, but as I've made very clear to the committee previously, the DARA position is that we must always work within the law and that's really what this comes down to. So um, it's it's not possible to say uh, much more on what, you know, until we've got the legal advice as to where that takes us because um, that gets us into the complexities of this. But I, again, I'll be happy to talk that through and questions. Um, I know committee members will wish to understand the implications of this for the SPS operational delivery program on the ground. On that question, I would reassure you that checks are continuing and that we will take you through some of the facts in relation to that. DARA has temporarily rescheduled planned activities uh, in relation to permanent facilities at the ports, and by that, um, primarily it's about uh, some of the contractors were getting ready to put uh, some of their um, kit and machinery onto the sites. Uh, but that's um, that's a temporary uh, rescheduled uh, bit of work on the basis that we're seeking legal advice, and we just we want to know where we stand. And Mark will be happy to talk you through that in, in more detail as necessary in a moment. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we've got time for the, for the advice to be provided and given proper consideration. Um, we will, of course, keep delivery partners informed as a position develops. It's worth adding that um, we had already been reviewing the scale of any permanent facilities. And you'll see why in a moment. But in light of the initial data from the live running of the program and frankly recalling that we've been working to a ridiculous time scale to deliver this we had been rebasing our program i mean we've done the contingency arrangements in weeks at the end of a seven month period and i mean if you compare that to facilities elsewhere that's uh, you know that's a very very short time scale for what we've been trying to achieve and i know the committee's been very supportive of us of us on that our best estimate is currently that even without the current issues, the permanent facilities would not be completed before the end of March 2022. And that's, uh, that's a factor of the volumes, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So what to turn now to our current position and our experience over the last two months. In doing so, it's important to state that we're running new operational arrangements. We're learning every day from the operation of those arrangements. And it's now clear that we're at, we're attempt, what we're attempting to do is, at the very least, a huge challenge. So as I've said before, without help from the UK government and the EU, it's difficult, if not possible, to see how we can meet that challenge. And uh, I would like to say at this point that we've been getting excellent support from our uh, colleagues in our sister department, DEFRA, and we've had, uh, we've had a lot of feedback from uh, EU officials, and that's also been helpful. And Robert will talk about that in a minute. Um, there are a number of implications which arise as a result of this, and the Chief Veterinary Officer will be happy to talk you through those in a few minutes. First of all, um, it's important to look at the scale of what's being done. Before I do so, I want to put on record my personal gratitude to all of the officials in DERA who have consistently and continuously done their best to meet the demands being placed upon us in the most challenging of circumstances. I'd also like to say that any numbers we use today must be caveated by recognizing that they're based on data from administrative systems in live operation and are not official statistics. So there could be some changes to them, but they are uh, an important indicator of the volume of work that's being done and what is required. The unit we fo focus on for the purposes of analysis is the Common he Health Entry Document. Uh, 
or CHED, and your hears talking about CHEDs, and sometimes you hear us talking about export health certificates, but you could broadly think of those as similar. There, there are differences, and we'll, again, we can talk through that. But in the period from 4th of January 2021 through the 28th of February 2021, there were some 57,486 freight units travelling through Northern Ireland points of entry from GB ports. On average, a quarter of these have been carrying SPS goods. Of these SPS freight units, 71% are retail. So as to give you a sense of it, within this SPS, at the majority is retail. Since the 1st of January 2021 up to the 28th of January 2021, some 13,629 documentary checks were completed on these CHEDs by DERA staff. And that is an important figure. This has increased consistently since week one, where we had just over 1,114 checks completed in one week. In the most recent Fate Week's figures, the comparable number was 1,938, just around 2,000 checks. This demonstrates a very significant improvement in compliance by the industry, and equally the hard work of the DERA team, who have been actively helping people transporting food into Northern Ireland to comply with the requirements as far as they possibly can. Some 92% of common health uh, entry documents are for products of animal or origin, or so-called CHED P documents. At this point, it's worth saying that the scale of documentary checks is huge by any standards. Our population, by way of illustration, our population is under half a percent of that across the European Union. Yet the documentary checks, according to the systems completed so far, would represent one-fifth of the equivalent documentation right across the EU. This reflects the fact that we are dealing with a domestic food distribution system and not bulk movements of international trade commodities. What is clear is that we're handling a burden of work which is stretching us to the limit and which can only get less sustainable as we move beyond the grace periods, again, depending on what happens, particularly those in relation to retail consignments, because if you think about it, that's where the majority of the, the, uh, the cheds will be coming from. So there have been some 11,984 identity checks completed to date. And identity checks, you'll remember, is where you basically open up the back of the lorry and make sure that what's what you're getting is matching the documentation that's been sent. This represents around 88% of all documentary checks. And again, it represents a very substantial increase with 936 ID checks in week one versus 1,734 ID checks in week eight. And it's been higher than that in other weeks. It's worth noting that this increase reflects, again, a better understanding of and compliance with the requirements by businesses and increased use of seal checks at ports and GB, which was something we were trying to do to improve the, to, the, the efficiency and implementation of the compliance protocol. To date, there have been 666 physical checks completed with 10 in week one compared with 137 in week eight. This represents some 4.9% of consignments subject to documentary checks. Um, we could draw a number of conclusions from this. The entire portal inspection team has been working extremely hard to complete a great deal of work to assist businesses in navigating their way through these processes. There can be no doubt whatsoever that DERA staff are conducting very significant numbers of checks, including documentary, identity and physical checks, and this within the context of the pandemic. The demand is huge and is reflected in the fact that we in Northern Ireland <clears throat> process documentation on a scale larger than all other um, entire countries across the European Union, according to the system, the, the TRACES system, which we use. Furthermore, we're achieving this ahead of a major change when the retail grace period ends, and there will be a huge increase in demand, building on current levels, which will not be sustainable with the staff and resources currently available to DERA. Um, in addition, given the new, given the projected increase in workload, it's difficult to see how, all things being equal, we could even source the numbers of professionals needed to implement CHED certification by supermarkets based on the current model. And, uh, however, we have made very significant progress and have worked closely with industry to mitigate some of the issues. And to be fair, you, you've probably heard that directly from industry before. So, for example, there's been good, close working with groupage companies to try on new processes. And this, is, this has proved to be very successful, not perfect, but very successful within the context that we're operating.
All of this leads us back to the need for further help and support from the EU and the UK government. And, uh, you know, that maybe gives a bit of evidence as to why that's the case. We're in very regular contact with our counterparts in DEFRA and they're aware of the challenge. And uh, they're taking forward a digital assistance scheme with retail businesses with a view to automating a lot more of the assurance processes in GB. While the, automa while the automation will be an important factor in the ability to manage the demand, um, for that approach to be genuinely useful, there'll need to be agreement with the EU that assurances can be provided through means other than paper documentation entered onto IT systems. It's only through this substantial investment in IT and, and streamlining processes that we can ever hope to meet the demands that are being placed upon us. And to be fair, if we get this to work, it can actually have benefits beyond Northern Ireland across, uh, I would have thought, for, for other uh, parts of the EU as well. In terms of grace periods, as I mentioned above, DARE is also implementing and preparing for the end of several deadlines, including subject to discussions, and as you know, all of this is live, uh, requirement for export health certificates at the, on the import of prohibited and restricted goods, which happened on the 22nd of February 2021, ban on prohibited and restricted goods from GB to Northern Ireland, 30th of June 2021, and requirement for uh, EHCs for retailers, 31st March 2021, and that's that the, that's you've seen the announcement yesterday. So you'll have seen the announcement yesterday by the DEFRA Secretary of State, George Eustace, on a series of further temporary operational steps to allow more time for businesses to adapt to and implement new requirements. The idea is to move towards phase compliance with full certification obligations for all traders, but over a longer period. In conclusion, uh, I hope that this information clarifies the massive tasks that our colleagues in DARA's uh, veterinary and animal health services, supported by uh, people actually across the department, have taken on. In doing so, we've learned a huge amount to date about the scale and nature of the challenges, um, which at least on the very face of it appear to be of a far larger scale than in any other part of the UK or the EU. And um, that being the case, there'll need to be some form of accommodation which can re render the task doable, as well as a recognition that as things stand, um, it's not doable in its present form. So for our part, with two simple objectives, comply with the law and keep trade flowing. We must always deal with the welfare of our staff as a priority, and that, that's a top priority, uh, because without that, uh, everything else doesn't work. Consequently, we'll, we'll now need to make decisions about how to use a finite resource to achieve the best possible outcome within these two imperatives. And that's really where we are. Robert will be ha happy to talk us through that as well. So look, on that note, Chair, we'll be very happy to take any questions that you have. Um, thank you, Dennis. And thank you very much for coming on such short notice uh, to the committee to brief us on this here. Um, just going back, Dennis, to, to what you said there uh, a second ago, um, you say that you're seeking seeking legal advice on the request that was made to you in relation to the porch decision. So, what, am I right in saying then that the minister made this decision without seeking any uh, legal advice, you know, from the the DSO or yourself or Attorney General? Is that right? Um, the the, the I, I should say at this point that the um, we the department has received a pre action protocol letter in relation to the minister's decisions. And that's the first step your colleagues will know to um, leading to a judicial review. So on that basis, I can't um, discuss the letter or whether it should have been sent. And I can't really talk about um, issues around that um, because it is it is subject. I don't want to pr um, prejudice legal, uh, that you know, the processes that are going forward. Um, and I have been advised by our uh, departmental solicitors that, that I am um, that I'm advised it would be improper for me to talk about um, the details around that at this time in front of the committee. I would have been very happy, as, I think, as you know, um, we're always very happy to talk about uh, how decisions are made and what's happened and we've given detail on this, but uh, we've given detail. But in this particular instance, I'm afraid um, the, the, the process means that I have to, uh, I have to keep, um, really focus on the implications of the, uh, of where we are. I mean, if it's any help, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I can tell you, we've got legal. We, you know, because it's not about the letters themselves. Um, we have 
two two pieces of legal advice requested. One is uh, um, in terms of how we deal with this. One is in relation to the ports, and the other one is in relation to charging. We've got uh, the charging advice. We would have actually been taking advice on charging anyway, actually, because I think there are some really fundamental questions, you know, questions that we need to sort out. But um, I, I'm afraid I, I, I'm really restricted in what I can say about the letters because of the legal processes. Um, I'm just. I'm just trying to get my head around this. So, like last Thursday, we, we got a written briefing from the department. You know that um, some of the implementation issues have been overcome, and that they, there was almost what six thousand sheds issued during the period up to middle of February. Um, so, I'm just curious that in say 24 hours, then this halt order was made. And I'm just wondering, Dennis, did yourself and the top team, were you aware that the minister was going to make this decision or were you like myself, and the chair and the members of the committee, the scrutiny committee of DERA, we found out from the press? I think I think the, the, there's um, the, well, there's two answers to that. There's two elements to that answer. The first, um, no, I wasn't aware that the minister was going to write until he told me he was going to write on the Friday. And then the letters came um, subsequently. Um, the minister on the issue of charging, the minister had raised the issue previously. And, um, you know, on the 16th of February at a meeting and had asked at that point, had instructed uh, me to stop, you know, work to develop charging. Now, um, the reason why at that stage, um, that wasn't made public was because I, I simply said, I'm going to have to seek legal advice before I know whether I can accept that instruction. And therefore, we were seeking legal advice on that anyway. Now, as it happens with the charging one, it's slightly more complicated because with charging, um, you know, there are some legal issues that we need to work through. So I was perfectly happy we were going to do that anyway. Um, we weren't, it wasn't changing anything that we were doing. Um, I think that that but in terms of the two letters that subsequently came, um, no, I didn't know about those until lunchtime on the Friday when the minister called me to inform me that he would be writing to me. And, and just finally, before I move around uh, the room here, um, I've established that you know the, the decision really has had no um, operational impact uh, in terms of the, the, the checks being carried out. And the other thing I, want, I just want to just pick up before I move around the room was... I just would be curious to know. The minister had said that, uh, that that because of the uncertainties, that he was revoking this decision to move ahead with the ports. So I'm just curious to know that back in October, I believe it was the seventh of October, um, Minister Pouch um, he uh, signed off on the con the contractors. The contracts were awarded to carry out this work, and obviously the contractors have, uh, were, have mobilised. So I'm wondering what. What, what lack of clarity uh, is there now that wasn't on the 7th of October? You know, obviously, Minister Pooch uh, felt that it was possible to proceed with it at, in October, and that was before the UK-EU agreement. So what, what lack of clarity is there now that wasn't there in October? And what's the implication for these contractors having been awarded the contract uh, and now, and obviously they began to mobilise, and now that the, the this decision, what's the implication? I mean, what's the liabilities there as well uh, for the project slipping? And I do notice that the that the uh, again from your comments, Dennis, that we we were understood that the project was to complete it by June July twenty twenty one, but that seems now to have been um, you know slipped now by nine months. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that are there's there's a number of points there. So I'm not going to comment on why, partly because. The minister. It'll be a matter for the minister as to why he decided to to take the action he took when he took it, and um, I can't comment on any of that any further. But um, I can say, um, in terms of you know taking stepping back from the political aspects of this, there are actually some changes to the program as a result of what we found out. I mean, the first thing is, I suppose, the volume of materials coming through. We now have two months. You know, to be fair, um, th nobody's really, this, the figures would suggest that nobody's ever tried anything like this before in terms of what we're trying to do. So we found out during the first two months before even the retail, remember we're not doing cheds um, on the retail side of things, which is the vast majority of the, the, the produce coming through. So we found out a lot from that. Now, the second thing is, I mean, in terms of the nine-month delay point, um, 
it's probably worth to, to just taking a step back and thinking about how we got to where we got to. So um, this is in, in a, our, the nearest comparison we would have would be Dublin. And, you know, talking to my colleagues um, in uh, Dublin who were working on this at the time, they were saying it was a full three years to get this up and running. So we didn't even have a basic enough line to start the program until uh, the following the ministerial or following the, uh, uh, the, the, the paper that went out, um, the command paper that went out on the 20th of May uh, 2020. After that, the program started. We basically had seven months to get everything in place. And that was the, um, the IT, the people, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the facilities themselves. And then it became clear we weren't going to be ready in time uh, for the 1st of January, which wasn't really a big surprise, but it was made even more difficult because, remember, there were decisions happening right up until the 1st of January, really, coming out of the negotiations. So we had a lot of uncertainty prior to that. And then we had a situation where um, it was clear to us that the first thing we needed to do was review this um, to make sure that what we were building was the right thing. Like there's no point in us building something that's got too many or too few bays, particularly too few, because if we have too few bays, then that leads to problems in terms of physical checks. So, you know, the, any kind of normal program at all would require that sort of proper scrutiny. And uh, and that's that. so what we found was we were going to have to um, review all of this. We've done that. We've been reviewing with our contractors. We haven't completed the process yet. But it was very clear talking to the contractors once we had got this up and running, we put all our efforts into contingency arrangements. That took seven weeks. And again, Mark can talk you through this in more detail. And then once we got through the contingency arrangements and got things up and running, which was frankly a small miracle in its own right, based on what, what we were facing, um, then it was a then we had time to start to say, right, okay, let's reflect on this and let's look at what the numbers are telling us. And I've just told you exactly what the numbers are telling us and they're very significant. So, you know, I, again, I understand this is a contested space and this is a very politically, there's a lot of political interest in this process for various reasons. But stepping back from all of that, there's some boring administrative program management that needs to go into this. And for example, the committee will be aware of, uh, you know, we would do things like gateway reviews. We've done all of that. We've stuck with that because remember, this is a 50 million pound project. So the idea that we're going to turn everything to contingency arrangements for seven weeks and then suddenly switch and go, yeah, okay, we're now going to have a six month program for spending a further 45 million pounds. That's just, you know, it's not, it's not achievable. So we, we were, we would have been coming back to the committee anyway, and we would have been talking about that. Um, but as I say, it's now set within the context of the, uh, the political um, or the uh, minister's announcements. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I'm going to move around the room here. A few uh, members are looking to ask questions. Patsy? Patsy? Well, are there now? Yeah. Yeah, Patsy, we're here loud and clear, Patsy, yes. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, Dennis, uh, thanks very much for coming along today, and I realise you've been landed with one here. But um, could I just maybe move you back there? You're... You're, the, you're the, the front guy. You're the person that is responsible for the operational matters. And we'll, we'll just aside the political stuff. Uh, in regard to the operational matters, I heard you, you took, you've asked for legal advice around charging. <clears throat> but specifically on the other bit, um, can you give us some detail as to what you've sought legal advice upon? In other words, the specifics about what you've sought legal advice upon in regard to non stopping. So um, I've just uh, sought legal advice on the minister's letters. Uh, the minister's letters to me on the twenty sixth of which with the instruction. So it's just to get it clear. So it's specifically you've sought legal advice on the minister's instruction to stop operations. That's what uh, you've sought. Legal on the That's it. The, the two the two elements there's two there was two letters there was one for charging and there was one for uh, the um, the portal facilities. So uh, it's specifically about this portal facilities and charging. Yeah. That's all you've sought legal advice on. Uh, yes, yes. Um, now, when I say all within that, there within particularly, for example, the charging one, 
um, we're looking for the full breadth of advice. As I say, we were actually looking at the charging issue and would have been seeking legal advice on that. So some of that earlier advice that we'd have been looking for will be incorporated in that. So there's some questions that need to be answered about charging, taking the politics out of it, if you know what I mean, out of that, you know, taking the uh, the minister's decisions out of it. We would have been doing that anyway. So so to some extent, all of that's um, coming in together. But yes, that's specifically what we have sought advice on. Just the stopping and the charging. The two right. instructions. Two instructions to stop and charge. Right then, that brings me on to, you've mentioned there, the contracts and Declan was was touching the chairman was was touching on it earlier there, uh, the contracts issue. Now uh, within that, I'm, I'm surprised. That's why I'm specifically asking that um, because you mentioned multiple contracts. Uh, so therefore, it'd be helpful to see to hear first of all how many contracts there are uh, for that, and secondly, leading on from that, um, I would be expecting to hear that you'd sought potentially legal advice. Uh, around uh, liabilities and uh, potential breaches of contract that could exist as a consequence of an instruction to stop. Look, um, some of us have been here before. I've sat on the PAC and I've heard about these things before. We've seen the implications of it for the A6 where additional costs have, have been added to schemes. So um, have you sought any legal advice around that aspect of it yet? Um, I think... Uh, we're, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to start talking about the detailed legal advice. I think it's I've I've gone as far as I can. I've said that I'm I'm seeking legal advice. We will be looking at all aspects of the outcome of that legal advice. I am required under managing public money to be aware of value for money. To in fact to to ensure value for money in the department, and where there's a value for money issue, um, I can either take a direction. Uh, if I don't agree with what a minister or any accounting officer, if they don't agree with what a minister uh, is asking them to do, they can seek a direction. Or um, in some cases, as we've talked about previously, um, it is it, there are some cases where if uh, it's just not possible to even seek a direction because um, something is not um, legal. So. Uh, I can't really go into any more detail other than what I've said, but I'm just reassuring you that we have sought legal advice and we will ensure that we have legal advice on all of the implications um, that uh, come out of this. But it, it's not possible um, at this stage. It is simply not possible to talk in more detail about that advice and, the, and that. Uh, I'm that sorry, advice. I'm not. Uh, to be clear, I'm not asking for the advice yes um just want to be reassured your accountant obviously you've been about the blocks long enough now just want to be reassured that advice has been sought or is going to be sought to protect the contractual aspects of this scheme i can absolutely assure you that we will be very uh clear about um the the uh the contractual advice, or the advice in relation to the contractual issues. We will be very clear about that um, before we take any action. So is that a yes? Yes. You have sought advice. You, have sought advice on no, you, said, you said, have you sought advice or will you seek advice? Well, which is it? Said. Have you sought advice or will you seek advice? Um, I'm not going to talk about the detail of what advice I've sought. I've, look, oh, it's, look, it's very simple. It's very let me let me just let me just put this away. We sought yeah. advice on the decisions. We sought the breadth of the decisions um, that have been taken. We're seeking advice on all of that, all of the implications of that. That's as far as I can go. So you're and that, and that will and that will that will have a, a, any implications arising for that, be they contractual or anything else. Of course, will be covered in uh, in the advice that we uh, are seeking and that we will seek. So because right sorry, there. all right, no, Dennis, I'm not being obtuse here. All I want to know is is the yes or no. I'm saying I'm I'm not going to go into detail on the advice we sought. That's legally privileged. I am not going not to go into advice. Dennis, I'm not asking for the Sorry, detail. Sorry, you are asking. You are asking me to go beyond. Look, I've said to you that we're seeking legal advice. I've said to you that we will be looking at all aspects of this, including the the, the contractual aspects. 
And yeah. I have said to you that we, I've given you assurance that we will be doing that, which is what you were seeking. What I'm saying to you is that there are a range of issues which will require us to have further discussions with our lawyers, no doubt, as we go through this process. And therefore, it's not possible for me to say to you, I mean, there could be other aspects, for example, we may need legal advice on. I'm not going to go into all that. We just, we just, need, to, we just need to make sure that all I'm, all I'm assuring you is that we will be looking at all aspects of this and we will be getting legal advice accordingly. And that we have been, the, the, the questions we have asked to date um, are broad and will cover all of the issues. No, just to be clear, Dennis, I'm not looking for detail of the advice either sought or given. That's all I want to be was assured that that's on your radar and that it that's is. being done. It is. It, it is. Done. Right. Now, that leading on, just if I could ask, um, how many contracts are there in relation to LAR? Okay. Mark, do you want to come in on that and just talk about more detail? Uh, morning, Patsy. Morning, Dennis. Morning, Chair. Um, yes, there are four contracts uh, currently awarded for each of the sites, for each of the point of entry at, at Lauren Warren Point, uh, Foyle and Belfast. And just to make you aware, we're working closely with our colleagues in CPD to make sure those contracts are carefully managed, um, not only through this period, but throughout the whole of the programme and the project implementation. So we're in daily contact, Patsy, with each of those contracts through the project management system, and we're keeping them up to date as, as we go forward. I hope that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Now, the one, just one final thing, Chair, and just with your your forbearance, um, any delays equals additional costs because boots on site, whether whether they're working or not, is is a cost to the contractor. Um, have you sought advice around potential that that could lead to for additional cost to the scheme? Um, again, um, there will be. So, so what, one of the factors here, so, so I'll tell you what one of the big issues is here. Um, at this stage, we need to be able to determine um, whether or not uh, we act on the instruction. Um, so that's the first step. So then after that, um, we, can, we can look at what the implications of it are, okay? Um, now, the issue with... Um, the issue with value for money will be much broader than any short-term uh, issue around our legal advice. And there, there are a whole range of factors in that that will need to be taken into account. Um, and we will take all of those factors into account. And one of those would be any delays resulting. Um, but at this stage, what we're talking about is over a matter of days, um, we're talking about actually getting legal advice, and we're getting some. Uh, we're getting this together, and the idea is that this will be something that the minister will want to bring back to the executive. So I think it's it's really, I I I, I suppose the the bigger reassurance is that there are a whole range of value for money issues that will need to be dealt with in this, and that we will be dealing with them. Um, but today, you know, there are other issues that need to be addressed first. And just on that. I just wanted to clarify that because you raised it there, Dennis. Hmm. Is that so? The advice, the legal advice that you get, and I'm very confident that you'll get professional, good legal advice. Um, that is the advice then that the minister is obligated to bring before the executive. Well, the minister, the, the minister will um, put a paper to the executive, and it will be um, informed by that legal advice. Okay, right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Philip. Uh, good. Uh, okay, here, look. Uh, Dennis, I'm, I'm conscious that this is the second time uh, in a few weeks that you've had to come before the committee to attempt to explain unilateral, uh, I suppose, and unsettling political decisions made by two different DUP ministers uh, in the department. I mean, the first one, uh, it won't be lost on people, was on the issue of safety and security of staff, and, th and that was taken by Minister Putz prior uh, or without the assessment of the police, and in fact against the assessment of the PSNA. Uh, and we know the result of, of that decision. I mean, and this second one is on, I mean, you, you said the first duty of the department is to act within the law. Uh, so, I mean, we, we now have a second DUP minister making a decision that may be well and probably is outside the remits of the law, and he hasn't took 
legal opinion first. So, I mean, we have two DUP ministers interfering politically on very important decisions that, you know, are clearly unsettling politics here in the North and clearly unsettling uh, business and trade interests here in the north so i mean i i don't don't intend to push you on the legal opinion i'm making those clear points in the outset that i mean this isn't the way ministers should be doing their business i mean it's totally at odds with in my view the way ministers should be doing their uh business and they need to realize both of them and the dup need to realize that these decisions are having wider societal impacts both in terms of heightening tension, but also unsettling businesses who across the north want to see the protocol working. In terms of specific questions, uh, Dennis, I mean, you, you, you have said that there so far there has been no operational impact. I mean, just can I, I seek a wee bit more clarity in relation to that? So what actually has been the impact of the two letters received by you from the minister, both on the current implementation of the protocol and the work that needs to continue at the, at the ports, and then on future uh, work and implications. So, you know, for example, there's been little conversation about the you know the, the halt on staff recruitment. So, I mean, as we go forward, staff are obviously going to be key to implementing all of this. So, so you know, has there been any? Uh, real-time implications on this now and, and into the future. And then secondly, in terms of time frames, you know, what next? Now, how soon do you expect to receive this uh, legal advice? How soon will we have some certainty? How soon can we move to the next phase of moving forward uh, so we can bring back some certainty? So um, I, I suppose I'll let, I'll let Robert talk about the staffing implications more generally, but before I do, I suppose the main thing, um, from our point of view, it's probably worth saying um, that there are a number of things which drive us. Of course, we have to comply with the law. Um, we also have to work uh, under the direction and control of ministers. And that's something that, um, you know, is uh, uh, just we have to bear in mind. We have to try to, 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 uh, to navigate that, um, but always within the law. Um, the I, I if I said I don't I didn't think I said that there were no implications. Um, I just said there weren't. You know, at this stage there weren't major implications. So, I mean, the main thing I, I mentioned it earlier was that um, you know, uh, in terms of putting the, the the contractors were due to put some facilities, you know, port cabins and things like that to prepare um, on site, and that we've just held that off until next week. Um, but the I suppose um, there is there there you know we're talking about here a matter of days. Um, again, we're talking about something. Part of the problem is that a spotlight has come onto this through because because it's a politically controversial issue now. But um, in terms of or because it, it always was to be fair, um, uh, politically controversial. But um, the the these sort of things would not on a you know a program of the sort of scale we're talking about a week or a day here or there is built into the program that's typically what you do because you know things are going to go wrong um there's going to be things so is it is it you know are we sitting today f with a fundamental problem in terms of the program no there are actually ironically things had had the announcement not happened or had the instructions not happened there are things that we would have been doing anyway and that we need to do because as i say um we need to make sure that the facilities are appropriately skilled we needed to know what was coming out of uh the discussions between the uk and the eu um, which can help us to manage the demand a wee bit um, and all of those things will have a huge i know even things like you know are the seals check seal checks working that makes a huge difference because it means we're not having to do identity checks in belfast or larne so all of these things are very very significant and we would have been looking at those and um, through a normal boring bureaucratic process but unfortunately Unfortunately, uh, this, as I say, it's it's a much it's the, there's so much interest in this that uh, that it's uh, created a, a, a attention. I mean, the the issue more generally with staffing. I mean, again, Robert can talk about it, but we we do have an issue with staffing anyway in terms of getting enough staff. Um, Robert, do you want to say a wee bit more about that? Oh, if you're there, Robert. Um, I'm on my own. The looks of things. Oh, go ahead, me. Robert. 
Yeah, can um, hear you now. I've been dropping in and out. Apologies, uh, Chair. Apologies, everyone. Um, no, uh, the, the numbers of staff that I previously told the, the committee that I'd be needing, um, and, and this wasn't guesstimates of what we thought might happen. We talked about 25 vets, 75 port inspectors, when what I actually have on the ground front line uh, is 12 vets. Uh, that's what I have. And I have um, 40, 45, 46 portal inspectors. Um, and then, of course, there are the, the local authority, the council staff as well, carrying out their checks. But all of us have the same issue in that we haven't got enough staff. Uh, and the work that this, the staff is doing to deliver what they're delivering is miraculous, and nothing short of it. Now, that's helped by the way we're doing these, as we've done before. The, the documentary checks are being done electronically. They've been done by, I have uh, 24 admin staff who are doing the, the routine business of the documentary check, and that's why the figures are what they are, and that's why we can achieve that. The identity checks are being done by agency staff at GB Ports, and that's how we're achieving that. Um, each CHED, each one of those has to be signed off by a vet uh, electronically online. That takes an enormous amount of time, and we're looking at other ways in which we can do that to release the staff, actually, the vets, actually, on, on the portal front line. But the physical checks have to actually be overseen directly by uh, the ones that we do by, by veterinary inspectors, EHOs, in the case of the of the local authority checks. And that explains why um, well, we achieved a miraculous 40% of the ones we should have been doing uh, and, and last week, this week's down a little bit. Um, so, but, but that's the bit that suffers. In the two weeks when um, uh, the staff were, were on, on lesser duties because of the security threat, you can see that with the physical checks that, that went down till, till the teens to 12, 13, 14% sort of thing. So the effect that um, the minister's instruction has had it's on staffing, it's had an effect on morale because people were hoping that the, the cavalry were coming over the hill and they're concerned that if this this halt um, continues for any length of time, that it will cause significant difficulties for, for filling posts. And that's part of what I need clarity on um, and need clarity quite quickly. Um, but you know, we, we have a, a machine that's, that's delivering us more staff. I have uh, 20 odd more vets uh, to interview uh, to get them in. Um, and a delay of a few days, as Dennis has said, isn't an issue. Uh, but if that goes on for weeks and months, then I do have real difficulties because right across the piece, including the local authorities, I think I can speak for them, we're all having difficulties with staff numbers. Um, and it's getting to the stage now where I need backfill to let staff have leave. Um, we're moving from what has almost been an emergency position, you know, 1st of January going forward. It's been sort of an emergency uh, to now business as usual. And that, and we really do feel that that's, it's now starting to feel like business as usual. And business as usual, people need breaks. And remember, this is shift work, which denatures people naturally anyway, uh, or unnaturally, maybe I should say. So I, I'm not downplaying in any way the, the, the challenges we have ahead of us. Um, so far, we're coping. Uh, and we're doing a, an extraordinary job. And uh, I, I, I hope that it's appreciated both across business and, and, and the community in general, the, the work that my staff are doing. Well, I, I certainly appreciate it by the members of this committee, Robert, so uh, I hope you pass that on. Uh, just, Dennis, then, if you could just outline the time scales in terms of maybe the, the way forward for the next while in terms of this decision. Yeah, so um, the we we have already got some uh, legal advice on uh, the charging issue, um, and actually, as I say, it's tied up with the fact that there are bigger issues about charging. We're in the process of developing that. It's not as as clear cut. Um, so um, I'm you know working up um, uh, submissions for the minister on that. Uh, the um, other advice, the advice on the ports, we're we're still waiting for. Uh, we had meetings with uh, DSO uh, with our uh, um, legal advisors and uh, to discuss that, and uh, we're waiting for that. But um, I would be hopeful that once we have that, we're in a position to put together uh, a paper um, which the minister could use then at that point for the executive next week. That's that's my intention. As I say, it depends on what comes out. It depends on what happens. Uh, you know what the legal advice says, obviously, and that's why, in a way, that's why I was trying to say earlier. Um, you know, we need to 
just see what we get back first, and then we can think about how to how to build that into uh, appropriate advice and uh, an appropriate paper. Okay, and just finally, Chair, I mean, I, I said I wasn't going to push you on the legal advice. Uh, I mean, because there's, there's a couple of separate things. There's obviously legal advice needed on the letter sent to you, uh, but there's also uh, probably legal advice on whether the minister could make this decision in the first instance without uh, consulting with executives' colleagues. I mean, is there is, there, is that anything that you're involved in, uh, or is that a separate uh, issue for the executive to take forward? I think I think I think that takes us into the um, I think that takes us into the proceedings that I talked about earlier, and I, I think I just I don't think I can talk about it. Okay, and then just finally, because it, st- it struck me there when you were talking about advice the last time you were here in terms of Minister Putz and uh, this calling the staff off. I mean, you, you had said that. I mean, he was obviously in conversation with the UP colleagues and all. I mean, I think it's it's not lost on people, and you're maybe not aware of who he was speaking to or taking ad- advice if it wasn't from senior civil servants or legal profession. That you know, the DUP at a senior level were meeting with uh, loyalist groupings uh, a few days prior to this decision being made. I mean, I, that that's not lost on people. Okay. I, can't really, I can't say. <laughs> Sorry, I can't comment on that any further. Okay. Okay. Right. Thanks, uh, Philip. I'm going to move around the room. Uh, John. John Blair. John. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I have a number of questions that I'll go through them together. But before I do that, can I say that I, I too am aware that this is the second time in a month that officials have had to come before us at very short notice, um, following unilateral action by a minister. I'm also very aware that the actions taken on both occasions have brought further attention to staff at ports who are already under, um, as we've heard again today, significant pressure. But but the, the, the questions are, um, given that we've established that there, there wasn't um, any consultation uh, by the minister with the, uh, it would appear, the executive, the assembly or this committee, or... Uh, extensive uh, consultation with officials, um, uh, and notwithstanding the fact that legal advice wasn't sought prior to the announcement either. Uh, c- can I ask for some clarification uh, about conversations that may or may not have taken place between uh, the, the first mention of this by the Minister to the Permanent Secretary on the 16th of February? And then the uh, eventual decision on the 26th of February. There's a 10 day gap there when conversations could have taken place. So, can we have it clarified that they didn't take place until the announcement was made? Um, the second question, if I can just go through all of these, Chair, um, some of us have been flagging up for quite some time, to be counted in years, the complications that would arise out of a UK decision to go for a harder form of Brexit. And we all know who backed that harder form of Brexit. Um, from from within Northern Ireland. <clears throat> Can I ask what, what progress has been made in trying to alleviate some of the issues in terms of reaching some kind of UK-EU veterinary agreement and what uh, and what level uh, DERA officials and, of course, the Minister are involved in trying to achieve that? Because that is directly relevant to, to some of the problems that have arisen and led to decisions taken. Um, the the other question is, I asked this in the chamber, didn't get clarification other than some constituency related uh, uh, issues from the minister. Was there any consultation? That this is um, an area we haven't covered at all. Is any consultation carried out before decisions of this kind uh, in relation to stop and works at ports um, or or bringing staff out of ports with the relevant sector representative organisations? Such as the business breakfast, uh, business Brexit working group, or uh, the retail consortium, or retail NI, or others. Um, I'm keen to know that because I, I think those representative organisations should be feeding in to these decisions, and I want to clarify whether they do or not. Um, and the other thing I want to know was was any uh, uh, co- consultation done with uh, Dara before the UK government's announcement yesterday of uh, their own unilateral extension of the grace period. Okay. Um, okay, so um, there's four issues there. I'll, I'll have a go at the, a couple of them. The first one, um, when the minister uh, first raised the issue on the 12th of February about charging, uh, he did say he was um, 
uh, it was he was instructing us to stop development. Um, I had um, said that we would obviously be getting advice on that, um, on the development of charging proposals. Um, and um, the idea there was really just to, to see where that would take us, because actually, the, as, I, as I keep saying, the charging issue is, is different and it's more complicated. Um, because, you know, uh, it's not quite the same issue as whether you apply checks or not. Um, and there are some really important uh, points that we need to cover. So, for example, again, taking the politics out of it, if we were putting a charge, in fact, uh, I mean, we were in this place anyway, for us to do a charging regime, we would have to consult very broadly with all those business groups. I mean, frankly, if we didn't, we'd be very open to, to legal challenge anyway, but we'd do it anyway because that's how we normally do business. We've, we've, we've worked in a very consultative way generally as a department as right the way through the, the, uh, the recent pandemic and also in terms of how we've tackled Brexit, um, uh, the Brexit issues coming out. So that... I, I, I can't remember just off the top of my head whether I would have mentioned it again. I probably would have said to the minister at different meetings, normal regular meetings, I'd have probably said, by the way, we're still seeking legal advice. So for me, that was absolutely fine because that was, you know, the minister had expressed a, a clear view as to what he wanted. Um, we were getting legal advice on that as we would have done anyway as part of a wider uh, piece. So it's quite possible I would have said to the minister and, you know, in margins, oh, by the way, I'm still getting, I don't, I don't know, but I mean, I, I would happily t check the records and see if there's any, any references to it in the minutes or whatever. But um, that's, that's, that's the answer to the best of my knowledge. Um, so really that would, that work was progressing away. And I suppose one of the things about the 10 days, when you're seeking legal advice on any issue, when you're seeking advice, it's really important that you help to you inform that advice. And for anybody who's tried to read, and this is the point where Robert will start waving it around, the uh, official controls regulation legislation, uh, which I know, oh, there he is. I knew he'd do that. Um, but that, you know, if, if you ever tried reading your way through that, I can tell you you'd need legal advice just to understand it. And um, so, there's something about actually looking at all of these issues. There's things like, you know, we'd have to look at equality issues, we'd have to look at human rights issues, we'd have to look at the, um, before we'd start charging, we'd have to look at regulatory impact assessments and all of those things. And you're absolutely right, that would need to involve businesses. So that, in a way, that was happening. Now then, but uh, the first I learned about uh, the minister planning to write to me was, as I say, um, on the well, uh, to my recollection, anyway, the first time that he, he actually phoned me on the, the lunchtime and said, by the way, I'm sending two letters to you. Not me, did, sorry, he didn't say, by the way, he said, I just wanted to phone you and let you know I'm sending two letters to you on these two issues. Um, so that's that's really uh, the background. Um, and, and as I say, the portal one, that was the, the first I'd seen of that instruction, okay, on the, on the actual facilities. The second one I'm going to let um, Robert talk about. I'll t Robert, if you're happy enough, I think uh, I, I think that answers probably one and three. Um, you know, these were, pro as I say, these were decisions clearly taken. Uh, uh, they were they, there wasn't a consultation process on uh, on these particular decisions uh, that I'm aware of, but um, not not a department consultation process. But having said that, um, I've no doubt that the minister, as all ministers do, will take um, all of the evidence that they're saying from as as indeed you do yourselves, um, what they're saying around them, and they will use that in, in their decision making. Um, the uh, of the EQ, UK EU Fed agreement. I don't know, Robert, if you want to say something about that, and also uh, some of the discussions uh, with Defra around the announcement yesterday. Yeah. Okay. So just for clarity, I meet along with CVO UK um, with Commission officials and veterinary colleagues in Grange uh, weekly, um, and the primary purpose of that is for the EU. Um, inspectors who are with us on a daily, early basis to download to me um, things that they've observed and things that we could improve. Um, and that's, that's been going on every week since the 1st of, of January. Um, on the verges of that meeting then, uh, the three of us, myself, um, CVO UK, and the, then the EU's uh, Chief Vet, uh, we have discussions on clarification. And, but it's about clarification about issues that are arising, uh, such as movement of goods from the EU into GB um, after the 1st of April, and, and then what checks will be 
required, what certification will be needed, uh, down into detail like that. But there is no discussion around uh, a veterinary agreement because that uh, can't happen until we have a political uh, agreement that that should happen. So there has been no discussion about a veterinary agreement at those meetings or, or anywhere else. Uh, so uh, just to be clear. And on the announcement yesterday, I was involved in initial meetings uh, with DEFRA um, to scope out what it might look like. Um, and there were at that time a couple of think papers, I think we'd call them that, rather than anything like what actually came out at the end. And um, then on the night before they were released, I think Mark and Brian Ducher were given, Mark Livingstone here and Brian Ducher were given sight of them um, around, you know, after closing time uh, the night before. And the first I saw of them uh, was, um, was just before they were made public. So that was the first time I saw them. So the answer to your question is that um, there was no meaningful consultation with us or involvement. It was a DEFRA paper. Okay, but it would appear something like 24 hours notice before the UK government uh, announcement. Um, well, I don't know if we, uh, it, we uh, really until it was announced, it wasn't announced. I mean, we quite often, you know, I mean, to be, to be fair, I'll just say this. I mean, we work very, very closely with DEFRA colleagues and yeah. uh, they're keen to work closely with us because, um, you know, they know that whatever they, they're thinking of, they want to run it past us to see from an operational point of view, um, would it make sense on the ground? Um, but that particular, I like, again, my recollection of it is that uh, we didn't actually know. Maybe, maybe that morning, I can't remember if we We'd even, but I think we'd been told the day before it was likely to happen, and then it and then yeah. it goes. And these things these things happen, you know. So like we we I, I suppose it's it's one of the challenges. Um, you know, everybody uh, and we want to do joined up government. We want to do it in a way that uh, that. Uh, you know that we're able to influence as far as we possibly can for the benefit of Northern Ireland wherever we can. Uh, but the other side of that is it's it's always difficult because then you know we're uh, being asked to keep confidences because um, and and also too you know it's it's something we have to be careful of as well because uh, uh, quite often then you know something might be run past us and then never see the light yeah. of day. Yeah, can can I just try and get a better feel again of um, how much ministerial stroke official um, Dara feed in there is to the, this discussion around a, a UK EU veterinary agreement. I, I understand it will have to be an agreement um, of a political nature between the UK and the EU, but I would have thought, given the, the um, direct relevance of Northern Ireland in relation to, to uh, points of entry and ports, um, that information would either be sought or offered. And I'm trying to clarify how much information, detail with regard to the Northern Ireland situation is being fed to that UK-EU conversation around a veterinary agreement? As far as I know, there's no discussion, John. But when there is, I'll be all over the top of it. Don't worry. Um, okay. And the point you make is a good one, is that the agreement will be between um, UK and the EU. So it'll be about flexibilities around and making movement of goods from, from GB to EU, uh, including Ireland, of course, yeah. easier. So it'll be, it'll, it'll do all that. It'll, it'll, of course, help us, but it'll be to help freedom of movement of goods, uh, you know, between GB, the third UK, the third country, and, yeah. and the EU in general. So, but yeah, first of all, the discussions haven't started yet, and when they do start, um, they'll, I'll, I'll be all over it. Don't worry. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, William, you're up next. William. Okay, got me now, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and can I thank Dennis and uh, Robert Norman and Mark for coming along this morning. Um, there's been a few political speeches here, and I suppose I should make one too, but I think it, it won't go unnoticed by many uh, in, across Northern Ireland that those that supported the current protocol have barriers between trade between Northern Ireland and the UK, and the UK and Northern Ireland, which has ended up in many businesses not supplying Northern Ireland. Indeed, we have hundreds of thousands of trees had to be cancelled, couldn't come to Northern Ireland because of the protocol. But apart from that, I believe the Minister made a reasonable decision given what he was faced with. Uh, we have a serious legal challenge to the current protocol. Um, 
the permanent structures will cost a lot of money and could possibly be a white elephant of this uh, for instance, if the legal challenge was successful in relation to trade between the UK and Northern Ireland, then they have an unfettered access. Uh, can I ask Dennis a couple of questions? The proposed cost of the permanent customs post uh, one question, maybe I'll ask that question first and then I'll come to the, the other one later. So Mark, Mark might have mo the most up-to-date figures, uh, just to give you more precise, but I mean, it's in the order of 45 million. Um, Mark, did you want to? Yeah, the current costs, uh, William, are 38.2 million pounds for the upfront capital expenditure. Um, so that's for the full build costs with 6.1 6 million pounds required for revenue costs. And that includes staffing across an all iron points of entry, staff program implementation costs, systems IT, et cetera. And just to remind you, there was about five million pounds was was achieved for spending on the contingency costs as well. Um, so we refer to those costs obviously as we look to, to rebase the program as we look towards building the full infrastructure. Yeah, and just to, to, just to add to that, William. Of course, um, that's that's where the numbers do commence. You know, the numbers are so important, and uh, what we've learned will be fed into that process. Well, for for me to spend forty five million in such uncertainty would be daft. And I, and I think the minister has made the right decision in the current situation. Can I ask you, um, Dennis, you did say the current model was a challenge uh, and that could mean a lot, but we're now in a grace period and it's, the current model is a challenge. And at the end of the grace period, can you see the current model being workable? Um, I think I think um, I, I've got to pass on to Robert to to give us a bit more detail on that. But I, I suppose at the minute you just have to look. You know the numbers do tell a story. Um, you know you can see that we've got about two thousand um, you know documentary checks per week happening. Now if you add then all to that, um, the if it, it depends on it. There's a lot of different factors, but if you add on to that all of the potential certificates that uh, you know would be required if you were moving to uh, um, you know to retailers um, then that's a very very significant increase so uh, Robert maybe if you want to talk in a bit more detail about that so uh, I sort of estimate and these are all you know very estimated figures but there are about 1350 um, chad peas for supermarkets for retail coming in at the moment and what we know about um, consignments coming through Northern Ireland ports, points of entry, um, to go to the south for supermarkets, uh, Marks and Spencers, for example, is that there's something between six and 10 export health certificates, six to 10 plant certificates, and about 50 catch certificates um, on for each one of those consignments. Mm -hmm. And that's and, and that's a load, that's consignments going to a supermarket in the south, so it's likely that it would be the same to a supermarket coming here. So that would uplift those 1350 um, Chad, one Chad checks that have been done at the moment, those those single Stamney checks that have been done at the minute, up to somewhere around twenty to thirty thousand, and that's broad estimated figure. So with the staff I have at the moment and the facilities I have at the moment, I wouldn't be doing physical checks in most of those just to be clear, because I would do a risk assessment and say that they weren't um, a risk to the public health, animal health, or plant health of Northern Ireland. Those materials coming in. Um, but that's a huge challenge. That's approaching the same number of CHEDP checks that are done for the entire European Union. And I've spoken about this to the Commission in purely technical, not political terms. But here is what I'm being asked to do by the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, with my currently 12 vets. Right, that's not going to work. Um, and, you know, that's that. That's where we find ourselves. So the extension of the grace period, if that's what occurs, is welcomed, um, but it's not the solution. Um, and we need to use that. If we do get the extra time, we need to use that to work our way towards a better solution. Remember, we're working at interim, interim facilities. They're superb, but they're tents. They're refurbished um, old buildings uh, up in Larne. You know, this is not a, lo a long-term solution. And um, back to the welfare of my staff, can I really ask them to work on those sorts of facilities uh, for how many more winters? Yeah. Okay, Rosemary, you're next. 
Rosemary. Uh, can Rosemary, are you coming in? Okay, we'll, we'll just we'll just slip past Rosemary and call her again. Harry, uh, are you there, Harry? Yes. Hello, Philip. Oh, Rosemary, you've got Andrew's name. Okay, um, I want to come back to the figures. Some of, some of the figures that uh, were mentioned at the beginning, and um, that is that is in relation to these checks, etc. I want to just uh, check over. I I think I think it was the permanent secretary that said that we have a population of 05 percent of the EU, and yet we're doing checks equivalent of as if we have a population of a a fifth. Of the EU, am I right? And can you explain and expand on that a little bit? Um, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have tried to have said said it quite like that because uh, I think I'd be, I used to be a statistician and I'd be struck off if I uh, if I tried to stretch it too far. But I think uh, it. I, what I would, we're talking yeah, about. But I think no. But I think your the point is we, you know, for for a very small population. Um, and you know we are actually, and, and as Roberts talked about, um, you know, not we're not we don't have the, the numbers um, clearly of a fifth of Europe in terms yeah. of the, the vets and uh, the staff. So there is a there is a serious point in there, and and that's that's where I mean we're already, um, frankly, as, as Robert I think has said already, again according to the traces system, which is the EU system that we use, uh, that um, we're we're doing more than most countries, if not all, um, in Europe. Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. um, so basically then, also to follow on from William said, it, the staff and maintaining the staff, if this continues at that, at that uh, intensive rate of checking goods, surely there's going to be huge problems maintaining staff and continuing on if staff are not getting holidays, getting breaks, and there's a shortage of staff? That's right. Uh, Robert, do you want to? Yep, that's absolutely right, Rosemary. And uh, irrespective of all things going on, now that we have a couple of months of data and we understand the size of of the work that we have in front of us, we you know we're, we're getting to a better place where we can try and estimate properly the number of staff that we actually need. And that process is going on. And then we have to get them. I have a process in place at the moment. Um, there are another 20 vets ready for ready for interview, um, and I'm just doing a continuous recruitment of, of vets and on portal staff. Um, we will look at what we have and we'll probably move some field staff in, into the port if we can. There's a difficulty with moving staff to do shift work from normal field work because you're not changing their conditions, so you really have to seek volunteers, and I've been very pleased the volunteers have come forward. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep working at that. But um, the Environmental Health Officers Local Authority, they have a similar problem um, trying to recruit. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's, it's a significant difficulty. I'm not going to try and pretend that it's anything other. Oh, OK, thank you. And the no, second question, Chair, if I may. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, S second question is, again, uh, Robert, it's to Robert this time. Robert, I was a little bit disappointed to learn that no conversation has yet taken taken place with in relation to um, inspections and in relation to veterinary agreements. So, am I to read into this that no conversation has taken place? So, unfortunately, our our farmers our our farmers are going to be disadvantaged now from. Over the summertime, especially in relation to moving livestock back and forth, bringing livestock across to Britain to sell and bringing it, then them buying and bringing livestock returning to Northern Ireland. All I've been talking to the Commission so far about is clarification of our understanding of current uh, regulation and current law. And they have been flexible where they can within the they what's written in the law already in helping me both with individual checks and with individual commodities, you know, defining as to what the law actually means. 
but no, there's been nothing on the detail of or around um, you know, the issue of, of the sheep and the cattle live, livestock, those particular EHCs coming in from, from, from GB. Um, those particular certificates are laid down in law, they're legal documents and they're yeah. published as legal documents. So um, I basically need, before the Commission can speak to me or I can speak to them or the, or the UK CVO more correctly can talk to the EU about it, there has to be some political cover for that and currently there isn't. There is no political agreement that those things should be discussed um, and that's beyond my pay grade. Yeah, okay. So, in other words, this is going to continue for some for some time, and that would be the same in relation to pets, the bringing of pets on holiday and bringing them back. That's correct. The position we're in at the moment with pets is that there's been no agreement on that at all. Um, the CVO for Northern Ireland made a unilateral decision not to uh, enforce. Um, yes. The law remains the law. Um, if I'm asked officially, should people be obeying the law? I will say they should, that they should be getting their animal vaccinated, they should. Um, but I am not currently going to enforce it. Um, and that's going to be extended now until the 1st of July. Yeah. But I'm still looking at it. And there are discussions going on um, between the Cabinet Office and the Department of Taoiseach, um, uh, DEFRA and uh, DAFN, around uh, the technical details to see if they can find um, some accommodation on that. But that's a discussion between the two governments rather than involving Europe. Yeah, okay. And especially where the, where there are assistant dogs and people coming back and forth, assistant dogs for those people. And back to my favourite line, Rosemary, sensitivity, <laughs> pragmatism. Yes. <laughs> Is where, right. where. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Harry? Okay, Chair. Yep, good job. Thank you very much. Um, Dennis, Robert, you're obviously very capable men, and you've done a superb job. Um, you really rose to the keys, and so I praise you for that. The scale of your task definitely would seem to me to be unreasonable. Um, you've already said I was going to ask you about, but I can't believe it. I mean, I fit the documents to process for half a percent of the goods that flow, but Rosemary has already covered that, so that was good, but maybe another wee point or two on it would do no harm. But what I was going to ask you then as well, what about the digital assistance system? Where are we with that? Anyway, please, thank you. Thanks, Chair. So uh, again, colleagues can, can give you more detail, uh, Harry, but I suppose the main thing on the digital assistance um, system is it's, it's um, this is being led by DEFRA. And again, um, we've had really good partnership working with them. Um, it's about more than just IT though. If it's going to work properly, it's going to need to include uh, a way of providing assurance that's more efficient than what we've got today. So just having something that automates certif certif you know, the current certification process mm -hmm. wouldn't really reduce the numbers of certificates that have to be checked. So we're hopeful that, uh, that this can develop. Um, and I think that some of the thinking behind the announcement yesterday was to try to align um you know align with the work that defra is leading on this uh but i don't know if um if robert or mark want to come in with any more detail on that i can comment dennis if that helps harry yes mark. There's, th there's three real three real uh forces to this piece of work on the digital assurance scheme so mm -hmm. it's the discovery phase the design phase and i suppose the implementation phase and as Dennis has just alluded to, DEFRA are the lead on this, but we're very much uh, in interacting with DEFRA on this because it's whilst the programme starts in GB, it ends in NI. So I'm very keen to develop a, a digital assurance scheme that, that really helps Robert minimise the checks as they come into to the points of entry in the four ports. And DEFRA have completed the discovery phase, so setting out exactly what they want to achieve. They've worked their way through that with the range of consultants on their side, and they're about to enter the design phase, and that involves really working with the, the four or five different customer groups across the, the, the hauliers, the retailers, the big retailers, the producers, um, and getting their points of view as to how this may or may work with them. And that process has taken place through a series of workshops on the 11th to the 18th of March. So we can keep you up to date on that, and I can write a, a detailed paper on the digital assurance scheme for the committee, should it so wish. 
would appreciate that. Thank you very much. And it, obviously it's great that it'd be a help to Robert too. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right. Um, Claire? 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 Hello? <laughs> yeah, Claire, we, we, can, we can hear you. You just look a bit pixelated, but that doesn't matter. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the most important thing. That's just the Thursday morning look, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, can I, uh, first of all, I, I just want to thank Dennis and his team, like others have as well, for making yourselves available again to us today at such short notice and particularly under the circumstances. Every time that you've been with us, um, you have made it abundantly clear um, how much pressure that you're all working under and how under-resourced you are in your continued efforts to carry out your duties. And we can only imagine how much extra pressure that you're now under in the current political pressure. Um, but I've absolutely no doubt that as the new minister took his seat, um, that you also briefed him on the challenges that you continue to face. Um, and while he has to date been too busy to come and meet the committee to discuss his priorities, um, we can look forward, I think, now to, to meeting with him to discuss that as dates are being set. But um, and particularly for Robert and his staff and the officials on the ground in the ports. Um, and, you know, again, I can, you know, just offer a bit of solidarity if it's of any help to you at all, um, getting through, you know, the, the workload and the conditions that you're under. I think it's absolutely shocking. Um, but for questions to ask, um, going back again to the, the legal issue and the legal clarity that's being sought, I don't want to go into any details at all about that, but can I ask, just in follow up to what Philip had raised, in terms of this potentially being a cross-cutting um, ministerial impact, uh, is there anything that you can say? I just, I, I think you might have answered it, um, Dennis, but is there anything you can say in terms of, do you believe that this decision was cross-cutting or is that firmly you know a, a legal matter at the minute i, th I think i think that's, that's, the legal okay. that's grand and listen see when you get the legal um advice back is that something that can be shared with the committee or is that privileged legal advice uh, well we will use it to inform any briefing for the committee but uh, we don't share legal advice because it's legally privileged okay thank you and see, in terms of the documentary checks and this lack of clarity that has been identified by the minister, um, in your opinion, can any of that be really settled with the UK government? Or is it all firmly within the remit of the EU and the Joint Committee? Is it, um, is it protocol issues or is it paperwork? Is it trusted traders? Is it HMRC? Are there those types of issues that can be done and settled domestically? I think if you look at most of the issues we're talking about, they're actually not supply issues. Or of course, we don't have enough um, vets and enough staff to do what we need to do. But um, if you think about the, the, the future, a lot of that comes down to what the demand is going to be, and a lot of that is outside of our control. So if you look at, for example, the digital assistance scheme that we're talking about or the movement assistance scheme, those are led in GB by DEFRA. And the reason for that is because that's 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 where the supply is coming from. So with our within our piece, our our job is really to to make ourselves as efficient as possible to work with our DEFRA colleagues to help them to to make the processes in GB as efficient as possible, and see where we can take it. Beyond that, then it gets into discussions between the UK and the EU, and that's where we really need the help. Can I just ask? Um, um, if any of the witnesses, Dennis or Robert or Mark, um, any members, can you just make sure we're muted if we're not talking because there's, there's a bit of feedback happening here? We're bounce back. Uh, sorry, we're cutting you off. Thanks. I just, um, two questions. Um, other um, points, maybe, um, hopefully quick ones, but there's a growing discussion um, that I'm picking up on from a few different levels and I want to ask you, do you believe that it's a viable option that um, GB ports could potentially take on the responsibility of carrying out all checks um, at some stage or, or is, has any discussion with DEFRA happened on that one? Um, and the other one I want to just 
um, check in with you is this unilateral decision taken by the UK government then to extend the, the grace period. In your assessment, does that put Northern Ireland at any further risk? Sorry, sorry, I'll maybe let uh, sorry, I think somebody still got their microphone on. Mark, is yours off there? Just checking. You're mute. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. Uh, well, look, uh, we're we're. Um, I suppose I'll let I'll let Robert answer that. Um, but I suppose the main the main thing. Uh, well, maybe I'll just let Robert answer it. <laughs> sorry, I was off yeah, the, Go ahead. The Robert. the carrying out of the checks in GB. Um, my interpretation of the legal position is that. The, these are checks entering the single market, um, with Northern Ireland having remained in the single market, and it's already a big step for the EU to allow uh, myself as a third country um, CVO, because remember Northern Ireland has left the EU, so I'm part of a third country as well. So they're allowing me as a third country CVO to take uh, carry out checks on behalf of the EU. Um, uh, at, at what they consider to be a border. So to actually move those checks from single market to outside the single market and actually carry out the checks in GB, uh, everything is unusual here, but I, I think that would be a step too far and the EU couldn't cognizance that. But you know, who, who knows what will change in the future? But at the moment, I can't see how that would be permitted within the current legal framework. I mean, the only, the only thing I would add to that is that from our point of view, we're absolutely uh, content to look at all options. Um, and uh, frankly, if there was an option that uh, took this uh, uh, from me, uh, I wouldn't um, argue too much. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'll get there. Okay, go ahead. Just the wee last one there, just in terms of the unilateral decision the UK government have taken then to extend the grace period, do, do, is there any feeling or sense with yourselves that this could potentially pose any further risks or bring any um, extra um, implications to NI? Well, I, I suppose uh, uh, DEFRA will have get, got their own legal advice and will we'll have worked through all of that. And uh, we'll obviously want to make sure that anything we're doing is compliant with the laws we've always done. Um, but um, from our point of view, um, I suppose just on a very simple basis, we're in a situation where despite the fact that there's been huge activity, um, we, we're not and could, neither could we be fully compliant with the OCR as we speak, because apart from anything else, we're developing our compliance and uh, we haven't got all the resources we need. And, and even if we had um, that there are other factors just in terms of you know what we've done in seven months has been a, a huge achievement but at the same time it's uh, it was never designed to be fully compliant on day one or even you know within a, within some months but uh, the, the big question for us is you know how can you cope with those additional volumes so anything that helps us in terms of controlling that demand from that perspective will help us to be more compliant all we can do is do our best to be compliant with the law and that's what we're doing Okay. Uh, Robert, sorry, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Is that only the 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 typical official reply, which is it's too early to say? <laughs> okay, sorry, I, didn't, sorry, I didn't think of that one. <laughs> sorry, okay. the French Revolution one, isn't it? <laughs> right, we're, we're going to move over now up to uh, Morris from the northwest. Morris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, that's me on mute now. Uh, Chair, I would suggest to Dennis that the amount of work that he and his officials have done uh, so far has been incredible, especially in the time frames available to him. Uh, and I think they deserve our grateful thanks for that remarkable amount of work that's already taken place. But uh, looking at the protocol from a layman's point of view, uh, on the face of it, it's an unnecessary burden on goods coming into Northern Ireland from GB. Uh, as well as the uncertainty and internal barriers to trade. We've heard it already, I think William mentioned it, that some companies have already stopped trading with NA. Uh, Dennis, he provided an update on the level and number of checks carried out in Northern Ireland compared to those carried out in EU MS states. So why is it more difficult to trade between GB and Northern Ireland than any other non-EU country? Is the current EU system of checking designed for complex internal trade or have the checks been overly complicated by the EU as a punishment for GB leaving the EU? Um, 
Well, all, all I can really say to that um, is that um, clearly the um, the approach, or clearly the the model as it was originally designed, was for um, inspections happening at borders, mm -hmm. and this is a very very different uh, situation. We are in an internal market, and in an internal market, there's a huge freedom of of uh, you know there's a huge freedom in terms of trade, and uh, that's um, why it's a, a huge challenge doing these checks on that on that mm -hmm. trade. I don't know, Robert. Do you want to add anything to that in terms of the practicalities? It's exactly that. Um, the, the system was built for a single consignment for international trade arriving at the edge of the European Union, um, not for what is basically, and I tend to think of it this way, as a check's been struck across a, motor, a motorway. Um, so this is not unlike uh, if you'd put a, a, a checks across the M6 in the middle of England and expected everything to flow nicely after that. This is, mm. this is um, you know, supplying goods, uh, both for retail and for manufacturing, uh, to Northern Ireland through supply chains that have been established over a very long period. And they have largely held up and haven't actually changed. So this, it's the same supply chains. And that, you know, it's it's not unexpected. People expect it. I think the EU expected the supply chains to change. You know, Asda has 600 plus supermarkets. They have 16 in Northern Ireland. They aren't going to change the supply chain for 16 supermarkets in Northern Ireland, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you know that that's the, the the crux of the difficulty that we have. It's non mm -hmm. supply chains for retail for manufacturing uh, that normally occur with within a country and member state, and we're trying to carry out checks in the mall, and the system simply wasn't designed for that. Thanks very much for that, Robert uh, and Dennis. Uh, just highlights to me that the actual protocol itself was ill designed and is not designed to work, but. Sticking with the protocol, if, if Northern Ireland moved to the, the full implementation of the protocol, what increase in checks would be needed uh, to be carried out at all ports? And when can we expect the issue of plants and animals and seed potatoes and plants with soil to be resolved? And what would the cost implication be to the documentation and uh, to the department and the extra cost of staff needed to fully man checks at our ports at this crucial time in the agro-food sector? We're coming into the growing season, as I would call it, up here. So maybe Robert, if you want to build on some of the earlier answers you gave to just uh, on that one. Yeah, it's, it's that increase I talked earlier about, uh, particularly on the on the Chad P checks from mm. from thirteen hundred or so up until twenty to thirty thousand. It's that le it's that level of checks, uh, both documentary and identity checks that would need to be done for those particular consignments. Um, which, because of the flexibilities we've done, if we staff it up, we probably can do. Um, and we we will use all the flexibilities uh, to avoid having to do physical checks on these goods. But it's a huge challenge. And it's a challenge that, um, in my view, isn't adding much to the to the protection of the, the internal single market as far as public health, animal health, and plant health is concerned. So, but it's it's the law. It's what we have to do uh, until other uh, negotiations uh, result in uh, another outcome. Um, the other question. Sorry, I've it's lost me at the head, Morris. What was your second point? What uh, what would the cost be to the department for the extra staff needed to fully man the checks at the ports? Uh, the price, especially at this this time. Yep. These costs are, are all being covered by uh, by the Treasury. So the resource course costs uh, that Mark outlined earlier are covering the, the staff costs. Mm -hmm. uh, so those will be passed on to Treasury. Okay, thanks very much, Robert. One last one, Chair, if, if it's all right with you. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, Rob, Robert, you had uh, earlier said there was limited uh, checks carried out since the start of January. What review mechanism have you in place to assess what checks have been taken taking place and what the impact will be on the planning for perhaps there might be unnecessary permanent bills at the ports. How do you think that could impact on what is planned and although the minister has stopped it at the minute? So where where the the ones that are 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 most beneath what they should be are the physical checks. Mm -hmm. And we're we've been 
Last week, for example, we carried out 137 physical checks, the week before 206, but that only uh, equates to 30 or 40 percent of what we should be doing. And uh, that that's the biggest concern, is having the facilities and the people and the time um, to carry out those those physical checks, which, which are really the most important ones. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Robert. Thanks, Dennis. Um, okay, uh, Rosemary and William looking in for short questions because I'm very conscious that we're, we have to move on to the Committee for Climate Change uh, very shortly. So, Rosemary, go ahead. Yeah. C can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just to say, it was to, uh, just to follow up from what Claire was speaking about the physical checks uh, being taking place in on the English, on the Great Britain side of the ports, uh, with the ports in Great Britain. We already have something similar here at the moment, uh, although it's in relation to humans. For example, at your Dublin airports and at your Shannon airports, humans are checked there before they go to America and everything is, all the checking, et cetera, is done there before they land. So when they land in America, they can go straight on in the US. So there's already a precedence being set. I mean, just to, just to build on that, I think I mean, it doesn't really take away from the legal sort of restrictions, but uh, I think, um, I mean, we, we are already using as much as we can that approach. So, for example, identity checks happening, um, as, a, as I said before, there's three levels of checks. There's documentary checks, which are done online, so we're doing those uh, remotely. Then you've got the ID checks, and the ID checks are we're trying as far as possible to make those happen in GB, um, and uh, you know through using seals. Um, so there, there is some we are doing some as much of that as we can. And but I, I think Robert's obviously, uh, I, I would never try to second guess Robert uh, as he knows the official controls regulation inside out. But I, th I do think, having said that, as Robert says, we, we look at we will look at all options. We're not we're not close minded. We've had to, frankly, to get to even this point we've had to look at every option we can and again that was part of the reason we were looking at maybe reviewing what we're doing to see you know have we got the right are, are we building the right thing for the right purpose okay thank okay. you okay william short one william william yes william can you hear, can you hear me now yes we got you yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can let me in again. Uh, Robert and uh, Dennis have both said that uh, implementing the current current protocol is a huge challenge. I want to ask them both: uh, can they can they both see the current protocol as it stands working after the grace period ends? You can see, you can see where each of us, each of us was fighting to get into that. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, uh, I, I think the answer to that is, I mean, you'd expect me to give a boring uh, uh, official answer because, to be fair, there are a lot of unknowns in that. So, but I think that what we can establish is, I mean, sticking very closely to the facts, we can establish that we're doing a huge number of checks. There's going to be a, um, if nothing else were to change between now and the end of the grace period, that could result in um, a huge amount of, a, a huge increase in that. We don't have the resources to be able to do everything that we want to do at the minute. And certainly the resources required to do uh, that bigger increase would be prohibitive. Um, but, um, you know, that's not to say that things could, there couldn't be improvements found. I mean, the one thing I will give credit to is the ability of the business community to both work with us and to adapt their processes. I mean, we've seen some of that with the uh, haulage companies. But, you know, if nothing were to change, I think uh, we would struggle. Uh, and I, I'm not sure we would be able to do the job. And that's that's the honest answer. But I would ho I'd be hopeful that, as, as we have before, we'll get help through the UK and the EU working together. Um, and uh, Robert, do you want to add anything to that? Does that seem fair to you? No, that's right. Very difficult if things remain exactly as they are. Uh, I don't believe they will. Um, we'll, we'll improve um, our systems, we'll improve our, our staffing levels, and I'm hopeful that something will, will change that will make the, the job more, more doable. We're not reaching 100% of what we should be doing at the moment. We probably won't then, um, but the, 
what, what I'm going to continue to try and do is the best that we can to comply with our legal requirements. Okay, thank you. Okay, William, thank you. Uh, okay, so, um, well, thank you very much. Um, that was a very wide ranging, detailed briefing, uh, good uh, d detailed answers as, as always. So I want to thank you very, very much for coming towards the coming to the committee this morning at very, very short notice and to answer all the questions in, in such great, great detail. Okay, so, okay, folks, um, uh, it's, it's uh, good, 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 good morning to you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Bye now. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Okay, members. Okay, members. We're moving on now to um, item six on the agenda, and that's a, a briefing from the um, Research and Information Services on the NA contribution to the UK Net Zero. I want to refer members to the re research briefing a paper, paper at page 19 of your pack. And I'd like to welcome uh, Susie Cave, the Assembly re Research uh, Officer, uh, to come into the spotlight. Yeah, we we'll have you here, Susie. And Susie is going to take this opportunity to, to brief uh, the committee. We will be able to ask Susie some uh, questions for clarification. Um, um, and then, obviously, following uh, Susie's uh, briefing, then we will um, consider the uh, CCC advice in, in more details and we'll be receiving oral evidence from the CCC as well. So, Susie, thank you very much for coming and joining us here this morning. Susie, you're muted. I can't hear you. Oh, is that is that? Can you hear me now? We got, we got you now. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you very much, and um, I appreciate now that I'm going to try and take you through this uh, paper as quickly as I can. Mm -hmm. So, if I can just refer you to page twenty-one of your packs. And the committee had asked for just a bit of an overview of net zero targets across the UK and the Republic of Ireland, and then a look at different programs across different uh, departments in Northern Ireland aimed at addressing climate change, and then looking at examples of uh, carbon removal uh, technologies that were mentioned by the uh, Committee on Climate Change. So uh, just as you know, in May 2019, the Committee on Climate Change, I'm referred to it as the committee from here, recommended that the UK should aim to be net zero on all greenhouse gases by 2050. And it has since advised on Northern Ireland's contribution. So just what is net zero? And the first section looks at this, and it refers to achieving a balance between the amount of greenhouse gas emissions produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. So when the amount of carbon emissions produced are cancelled out by those removed, the UK will then be considered a net zero emitter. So obviously the lower the emissions, then the easier this becomes. Section two of the paper looks at current net zero targets. And while table one, it shows what the recommendations are for here. And the Committee on Climate Change has recommended an overall 82% reduction of all greenhouse gases by 2050 with an interim of 48% by 2030. It's also suggested supplementary targets for CO2 net zero by 2050, or 96% for all greenhouse gases if methane is excluded. Now, table two in the paper shows the targets for the rest of the UK, the Republic of Ireland and New Zealand, all of which aim for net zero by 2050, apart from Scotland, which aims for net zero by 2045. Just after the table, um, I have provided detail on Wales. Uh, Wales really is an interesting example because like Northern Ireland, the committee had previously advised on a contribution to net zero of 95% by 2050 back in 2019. This was in part due to its high agricultural emissions and potential impact on the sector. But the latest advice uh, by the committee states that net zero could now be possible for Wales. And this is mainly due to the new sustainable farming policy in Wales. Also, uh, the small negative economic impacts the committee now um, feels that uh, Wales would experience from uh, achieving and transitioning to net zero. 
and also the suitability of Wales for converting farmland to woodland, which also could potentially create revenue for farmers. So the next part makes reference to some of the costs in relation to Wales. And the committee suggests that Wales alone will need an increase in low carbon investment of three billion pounds per year to 2050. And it suggests that this could be provided by private companies and individuals with costs recouped through lower operating costs. And that in fact, many of the costs for reducing emissions in Wales will likely be paid for at the UK level. So just moving quickly to some uh, considerations and questions in relation to this. Is the suggested target for Northern Ireland presented in a similar manner to that of Wales with the idea of considering working towards a net zero target by 2050? New Zealand legislates for greenhouse gas net zero by 2050 and also a biogenic methane target. Now the committee has suggested supplementary greenhouse targets here excluding methane. Is this due to, to the potential impacts on agriculture and production and also what about ammonia? And this is also covered in an information box in relation to ammonia as well within the paper if you want some more detail. Uh, also, the Republic of Ireland sets sector-specific carbon budgets, not known as decarbonisation target ranges. So is this something that could be considered for Northern Ireland to give a more statutory joined up or holistic approach to addressing climate change across sectors? Moving on then to main sources of emissions, and that's on page 30 of your packs. Uh, the figure here shows that the largest sectors in Northern Ireland for emissions are agriculture, 27%, then transport at 23%, and energy supply at 15%. Figure 3 illustrates that transport has shown the greatest increase since 1990, with 29%, and DERA attributes this increase to growth in demand for transport, and also a 1% increase in agriculture emissions due to increased livestock numbers. My box two also considers an, um, another sector, and that is the land use sector in Northern Ireland. And it's considered the only place in the UK where it is a net emitter of greenhouse gases rather than a sink. And this has been attributed to changes in land use and carbon stock over the years, such as the conversion from grassland to settlements and crop, and crop land converted to grassland. Now, Section 3.2 of the paper shows how we compare with the rest of the UK, uh, with transport really being the number one emitter and agriculture uh, in fourth position. But if we look at the Republic of Ireland, the emissions profile is pretty similar to here, with agriculture having the largest contribution to greenhouse gases. In fact, the ROI's proportion of greenhouse gases from agriculture is said to be the largest in Europe, Yet its food products, such as milk and beef, are one of the lowest carbon footprints internationally. And the, uh, the Irish um, Agriculture and Food Development Authority is aiming for carbon neutral far farming by 2050. So the committee also asked for um, a consideration of programmes across different departments and um, programmes and initiatives. So the table in the appendix to, the, to your paper, um, it starts on page 50, and this is rather large, and I'm not going to go in and out through it all, but really it uh, demonstrates the array of programmes across different departments that address climate change, both directly and indirectly, but in a rather fragmented way. Now, there is a cross-departmental duty under the Climate Change Act for all departments to prepare a collective adaptation plan. However, there appears to be a lack of joined-up strategic approach for working towards the most up-to-date targets and mitigation measures. Some programmes are very much out of date and are not suitable for reaching most recent ambitious targets. Some appear to be more focused on a reactionary response to climate change rather than mitigation. And we appreciate that we're at a time of significant policy transition uh, coming out of COVID-19 and Brexit. So therefore, it could be argued that, there's, that it is essential to have a more joined up approach across sectors so as to contribute to net zero. And this brings us to some considerations on how to address this. The Climate Change Act in the UK takes a voluntary approach to adaptation reporting by public authorities. 
However, Scotland goes further with a legal duty for reporting both mitigation and adaptation by public authorities. The Republic of um, Ireland uh, provides for sector-specific carbon budgets. So what priorities could a Northern Ireland Climate Act give to a more joined up and holistic approach across departments, both in relation to adaptation, mitigation and reporting? Also, the green growth strategy, for example, which is uh, being developed, could this be considered as the main holistic approach to addressing climate change across sectors? And is this enough? Now, the Climate Change Committee itself suggested a number of other policy gaps that are needed to be addressed. And some of these are mentioned on page 38, such as developing a route to market for low cost renewables, such as onshore wind, replacing cap payments with payments that are linked to agricultural emissions reductions and sequestration, increasing the rate of tree planting, introducing policy to incentivize homeowners to install low carbon heaters, and replacing oil boilers with heat pumps, and assisting in the more rapid deployment of electric vehicles. So members may want to just explore these details a bit more with the committee on how these gaps may be addressed in a more holistic manager manner. Now, the final section of the paper considers technology um, and especially greenhouse gas removal technologies. And appreciate this is a rather technical area. Um, and according to the Climate Change Committee, these technologies include carbon capture and storage. And these are explained in more detail in the information box three on page 42 of your paper. Carbon capture and storage refers to the process by which carbon dioxide that would have been released into the atmosphere from industrial waste gases is captured, compressed into a liquid state, transported by a pipeline, ship or road, and pumped into a geological storage site. And it can capture upwards of 90% of CO2 released through activities such as burning fossil fuels. And there's two main forms, both explained in more detail there in the information box. However, further research is needed on both of these technologies in terms of their efficiency, costs and impacts. And currently there's 21 operational facilities globally, but none in the UK. And the government aims to deploy CCS at scale during the 2030s. And the 2020 budget announced an 800 million CCS infrastructure fund to establish at least two sites in the UK, one by the mid 2020s and the second by 2030. Um, in fact, in the fifth carbon budget, the committee estimated that CCS could halve costs in achieving targets then, and the IPCC has said that uh, the absence of it could in fact increase costs by over 100% at the global level. So in relation to these technologies in Northern Ireland, the committee has explained that Northern Ireland is not well suited for it due to the lack of potential CO2 storage sites. And these are shown in figure five. Due to this, captured CO2 would have to be transported to a storage site, which could incur additional costs. The members may want to explore further with the committee why Northern Ireland has little potential for CO2 storage compared to other parts of the UK. And are there any plans to help improve it as a location? Just moving on then to final considerations here. The climate change itself has, um, has suggested that there's a number of unique circumstances in Northern Ireland which may determine what is suitable um, and what is not. One of those being the ability to decarbonize the main emitting sector, being agriculture, and its reliance on livestock. Now, compared to arable crop based farming in the rest of the UK, livestock based agriculture is much more carbon intensive. And also, we've seen um, in uh, section 3.1 the impacts that it's had on nitrogen emissions here. So, really, the issue is that a complete change in farming practices would be required in Northern Ireland, which makes decarbonisation much more difficult compared to other sectors and jurisdictions. There's also a lack of infrastructure for gas and electric charging, which may limit Northern Ireland's ability and options to decarbonize. 
and also the land use, land use change and forestry sector. Again, with Northern Ireland being the only part where it's considered a carbon source rather than a sink. Also, our forest coverage here is around 40% lower than the rest of the UK as a whole. Um, emissions from degraded peatland could also add around 9% to our emissions, which is higher than in England and Wales, but lower than Scotland. So some further considerations. Has the Climate Change Committee taken into consideration the potential contribution sequestration could make to Northern Ireland in offsetting emissions? In terms of future agricultural uh, policy, the committee suggests there will need to be a substantial change in farming approaches here. And um, agricultural policy is currently at a stage of transition post-Brexit. So will a new climate change act take into consideration new agricultural policy requirements or the other way around? Is the future agricultural policy to be considered the main vehicle to creating change in farming practices? How much can we actually decarbonize the agriculture sector? Does the committee suggest a move away from livestock farming? Um, how will this all be encouraged? Will it be through grants or enforcements and who will provide those? And will they be enough to offset the costs? Finally, has the committee taken into consideration uh, the Northern Ireland and the Ireland Protocol, especially in terms of the difficulties with importing trees we've experienced lately, import of new technologies and ensuring they meet EU standards. Also, as mentioned before, the fact that large power stations in Northern Ireland remain under the EU ETS and how this and future common frameworks might impact net zero contributions, and also potential compliance and oversight complexities with the EU Commission and a potential OEP, and also the existing NEIA, all influencing this. Also then finally, in terms of costs, and what have been considered, um, what consideration has been given to Northern Ireland and its unique circumstances and how these will be met. And in relation to the budget, anything going uh, forward, what will be considered to improve in Northern Ireland as a better location for these um, CCS technologies and for any alternatives that may be developed, such as wind or tidal. So I appreciate this was a bit of a gallop through this paper, but I don't want to take up any more time. And if members have any other questions at any point that they want to um, give to me, that's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Susie. Um, and that, that's... A, a really big piece of work that you've done there in terms of, along with Josh, in, in terms of uh, collating that and doing the research into that paper. And we're very, very appreciative of what you have uh, did here for the committee to help inform us on all of this here. So um, the numbers, uh, a number of me members uh, who want to ask maybe from, and from maybe points of clarification or some issues are relating, uh, some things that might want clarification um, relating to the paper. So I'm going to ask uh, Philip to come in here first, Philip. Philip? Thanks, Chair. Chair, I had a couple of questions. Susie uh, actually addressed them. Uh, I'm conscious of time. I just want to sort of add what you said. This is a really, really useful piece of paper to allow us to interrogate in the next section. I mean, the key point, I think, uh, and highlighting uh, is the fact that, you know, net zero for the North doesn't mean net zero. It, it, it's kind of a 82%. Uh, reduction and contributing to a wider thing. So, I mean, it, and my, from my point of view, it, it probably shows a lack of, of, of ambition. So, we, we plan to ask questions. And, that. and and the other thing, I mean, you, you talked about Wales, you know, increasing their ambition. So, I mean, if they can do it, there's no reason why we can't. I mean, and the other key point is obviously the, the stuff that, uh, in terms of the all island and the targets, we need to work on an all island basis. So, no, thank you very much, Susie. This has been very, very useful and informative and really appreciate it. Okay, um, Claire. Chair, I'm very conscious that the uh, the next session is waiting to come in, um, and I'm okay. Um, maybe just rattling on. I come back to Susie at another time for a wee cup of coffee because that was a great report. And thank you for it. <laughs> John. 
Uh, yep. Same situation, Chair. I had a very quick question on cross departmental target uh, setting, but we can I can pick it up at a later stage. And thanks to Susie also from me for the detail that was provided. Mm -hmm. Susie, if you stay online, you'll be able to see how your good work has been put to use whenever we start to ask questions of the CCC. <laughs> Thank you very much. And you can um, email me at any stage as well for any follow-up to anything. So. Right, well, William? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Susie, for your detailed presentation. It was very good. And in relation to uh, Northern Ireland, the way we heat our homes, there's a lot of homes heated by oil. Um, do we know what that creates, or is there any way of reducing that? Um, it's actually one of the areas that we are uh, struggling with um, at the moment. In terms of meeting targets, we're, we, we had a 10% um, renewable heat target by 2020, which we haven't met. Um, a lot of it is probably mainly due to the lack of um, gas network here. Um, especially compared to the rest of the UK, I think we're sitting at around 24% who are connected with gas network. In the rest of the UK, it's up on 87%. So it makes it difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Morris? Yep. Yes, sorry. Right. Yep. Can you hear me there, Chair? Yeah, indeed. Yes. Yeah, I'd just like to thank Susie very much for her detailed and very informative presentation. I've just one wee query, and it can be asked or answered today or, or, or by email, and that would, if Susie could provide some information on the impact of the protocol on the net zero uh, targets for Northern Ireland as part of the UK legislation, or will we be bound by the EU legislation? Maybe not for now, Susie, but I, I would be happy enough if you could give me some details, even by email. Certainly, um, yes, Mars, I can try and go into that in a bit more detail. It's also something that I think um, definitely want to ask the Climate Change Committee as well, because in their um, advice, I didn't see any um, reference to the protocol and the impacts that that might have in, in us reaching net zero. And the fact that we are, some of our power stations are going to be um, under the ETS, mm -hmm. probably, um, under the EU ETS compared to the UK and common frameworks. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that a bit further with you. But I think it's a good one to ask the, the Climate Change Committee too. Okay, thank you very much, Susie. Thanks, Chair. Right, thank you. Um, and thank you very much, Susie. Um, uh, um, really appreciate that there. And it's going to be very, very, this is really useful for the next engagement we're having here now. And um, Thank you very much for all of your hard work. We'll, 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 we'll be in contact, and you, you might even want to log on to see how things go in the next session here, okay? So, okay, take care, Susie. Thank you very much. Bye, now. Bye, Susie. Um, okay, folks, um, so um, item seven, then, we've written written, which is a consideration of responses to climate change committee's advice on emission targets. You'll recall we wrote out to various organisations asking for a response to the letter by the Climate Change Committee to the Department and the Department's subsequent response. Members can see the summary of the response, page 65, along with 14 full responses at pages, uh, page 86. And members may wish to refer some of these issues referenced in the submissions during your briefing with the Climate Change Committee. Members will okay, be publish these letters on their website. Okay? Okay. Okay, members, we're going to move on now to item number eight. It's oral evidence from the, the Climate Change Committee. I want to refer members to the following papers. The clerk's brief is at page 166 and the CCC advice to Minister Poots is at page 171. Other papers can be found at page 217 to 269. I want to welcome by uh, Starleaf, Lord, Lord Debon, the, the, the chairman, Chris Stark, the chief executive, and uh, Keith Bell, the Climate Change Committee, uh, Climate Change Committee member, and I'd like to invite the committee, to, the Climate for Committee Change, to take uh, ten minutes to to brief the committee, and members will then um, ask some questions. So you're very, 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 very welcome uh, this morning, Lord Demon, Chris, and Keith, uh, and I'll maybe invite you maybe to start off your briefing. Well, thank you very much indeed, and um, I was very pleased to hear um, much of the briefing that you've had from your um, advisor, and I must say I thought she did it extremely well. I uh, certainly support what so many of your members said. Um, perhaps it would be worthwhile just for me to put the background in as to 
where this all comes from. Uh, the Climate Change Committee was, of course, set up under the Climate Change Act, which was um, passed by a huge majority in the Houses of Parliament, um, some uh, 10, or year, 10 or more years ago. Um, and uh, the uh, Act demanded of us that we do a series of things. The first is that we produce five yearly budgets, and we have produced six of those. Five of them have been put in front of Parliament and have been agreed. The sixth one we published in December last year, and that will be put before Parliament because that's what the law says it has to be by June this year. Um, and uh, the idea of these budgets is to enable us to reach our targets. Of course, the targets uh, were to start with 60% reduction on our emissions in 1990. They then moved up to 80%, and now we've accepted net zero. And of course, net zero means that um, those areas which cannot reduce their emissions to nil will have to be compensated for by taking um, carbon out of the atmosphere, by sequestrating it, largely through things like um, uh, planting trees or improving the fertility of our soil. There's a lot that more can be done in the offshore areas around our nation. Sea can sequestrate much more than it does at the moment if we treated it differently. But that is all has to be offset in that way. But it doesn't mean... Uh, the usual explanation of offsetting, it means simply that we take the carbon out of the atmosphere to make up for that carbon that we put into the atmosphere. And that's why it's net zero and not zero. Uh, the situation is that uh, we were the first country to accept and to make a, legally, a legal requirement of net zero, which we did um, under Mrs. May's premiership. Uh, now, a whole range of other countries have followed us, uh, most of them fitting to the same date as we are, which was uh, 2050. That was a date which the Climate Change Committee fixed as being the earliest date that we can do this in a reasonable, cost-effective manner. And uh, although it will be very tough, it is certainly achievable. That's why Parliament passed it. And that has now been supported by um, China, but not until 2060, by South Korea, uh, by Japan. And the announcement by Joe Biden is that America will do the same. So we can now say that the majority of the countries which we would call industrialized, because the EU is signed up to the same thing, uh, are now in the same position of reaching net zero. Now, the program for reaching that is laid down in these budgets, and the sixth carbon budget is the one uh, which to which we have referred in giving our advice to you about uh, Northern Ireland. And uh, one has to uh, express the way in which we have looked at the United Kingdom as a whole, um, and we have been giving advice to uh, the Scottish government, to the Welsh government, and now to the government in the north of Ireland. And uh, the concept is that we recognise that different parts of the United Kingdom have different pressures and different problems. And therefore, we now have a situation in which uh, Scotland um, is, has agreed to reach net zero by um, 2045, uh, Wales by 2050, um, and we have expressed our view that uh, the Northern Ireland has a much more uh, difficult position from the rest of the United Kingdom, and therefore we have suggested that uh, the level to which you should reach would be less ambitious than the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, uh, of course, we'd be very pleased indeed if you decide you want to do better than that. But our job is to try to make sure that you as a government um, and uh, the uh, arrangement that you have in the North of Ireland are actually such that you can genuinely say to all the people 
uh, of the province that you are absolutely able to reach this end, tough though it will be. And that is the basis upon which we have uh, presented that to you. Now, of course, it does mean that the rest of the United Kingdom is going to have to do more than it would otherwise do in order to make up for that. It's a kind of bubble arrangement which we have in the United Kingdom. Um, and indeed, that is a principle which we have taken before. I was the Secretary of State for the Environment when uh, the United Kingdom voted for the bubble in the European Union, where we accepted that some countries in the European Union would uh, do things more slowly than uh, others, and that Britain would take a bigger part than some other countries because we were in a better position so to do. And that has been the development. And of course, that is what will happen around the world as a whole. So it is an acceptable way of dealing with it. But if you wish to do better, then I shall be very pleased because that will mean that I shan't have to ask other people to do a bit more in order to make up for what's happening in Northern Ireland. Now, can I just therefore return to the key things which I think one needs to talk about? Um, as you know, my background is uh, of being a, a, the Minister for Agriculture. I am, uh, to declare an interest, a small farmer. Um, I produce um, uh, very good quality um, uh, beef uh, organically, and I also um, produce and um, we're, trans we're moving across to organic for all our arable production as well. So I hope I've got a direct and hands-on view about uh, agriculture. And we do recognise that in the North of Ireland, there is a real issue about agriculture because it is so much more important to you, both uh, as uh, your farmers and also, of course, uh, for your major export uh, business, in the sense of exporting to the rest of the United Kingdom and beyond. Uh, therefore, you do have a major issue uh, with that. And there is no doubt that we're going to have to have significant change in agriculture right across the board. I want to say here, though, that that is going to happen anyway. Um, it's bound to happen, partly because of the government's decision to change the way in which support operates uh, from the common agricultural policy uh, to a system which we will have with its differences around the United Kingdom, uh, but which will, which will be very much more uh, placing the emphasis on the environment, on public goods and the like. Those changes will make a big difference anyway I am one of those who warn very strongly about the difficulties which those changes will bring about. Second thing is that there are huge changes in the food market world in any case, from those which are beneficial to farmers, much more interest in origin, are these animals properly brought up, animal welfare, pasture fed, animals, things that really benefit the North Island, to the other end of it, which is something which farmers have got to take into account, which is that the shift to more plant-based um, diets is not something forced upon people, it's something that people are deciding upon themselves. And there is no doubt that the um, meat substitutes um, and uh, <clears throat> indeed lab-grown meat are going to be part of our future. So that those of us who produce meat have got to recognize that the world is going to change for us and we're going to have to be able to present the highest standards and the real choice to the public in a way which we haven't had to do up to now. And so that's going to happen anyway, irrespective of what the Climate Change Committee um, suggests. And indeed, we have been very uh, conservative in our views. We have only said that there should be a 20% reduction in meat eating. And we've encouraged people to say that we should eat less meat, but meat, eat better meat, which must benefit the Northern Irish meat producer. So I don't shy away from the fact that we're going to have to see big changes. They will take place in any case. 
Um, but climate change will will pressure will put the pressure on significantly. But I would remind you of the comment of your researcher, who pointed out that the um, carbon footprint of meat produced in the United Kingdom as a whole, and therefore also in Northern Ireland, is lower than the carbon footprint of most um, other producers, which is one of the reasons why I personally am constantly reminding people that if we're going to ask our people to reduce their emissions, they must not be undermined by imports from other countries that are not doing that and which can therefore sell at a lower price. And that is an issue which the government has accepted and stated that it will do so. I'm only sorry that we haven't so far been able to put that in the law to make sure that they can't. I have two other things to refer to. Uh, Northern Ireland has got a real issue about peatland. The restoration of peatland is crucially important. The Climate Change Committee makes it very clear that it is no longer acceptable to use peat for horticultural purposes. We do believe that that should be banned and that it should be the main aim to recover the peatlands in a way which is necessary if we are going to meet our net zero demand. And of course, part of the way in which we balance the emissions which are inevitable from human existence, and certainly for animal husbandry, uh, we have to grow many more trees. And uh, the north of Ireland is less um, generously uh, covered by, by forests, and this is an area of very considerable importance for us. I, um, I just want to finish with one very simple sentence. Climate change is happening. It is very serious. It is the biggest threat we have, and there is no vaccine to stop it. And we are in this all together. And that's what the meeting at um, uh, Glasgow in November will bring home. Uh, Paris five years ago was a huge success. We've now got to make it even more so. And uh, it's going to be tough for all of us. But we are in it together, and we don't expect the North of Ireland to do more than it can do. What we are asking of it is something that it can do, but I'm afraid has to do. There is no alternative, and uh, we must ask for the greatest cooperation that we can have. Okay. Okay, uh, Lord Devon, thank you very much for that. I, um the number of uh, members who will be asking, who wish to ask questions. Um, I suppose what, one of the things that, um, so, some of the issues that you've referred to there will certainly uh, call, present, certainly present challenges because, you know, we, we are a, a food producing country. Um, all of Ireland is a food producing country. Um, indeed, here in the north, we, we produce with enough food for um, over 10 million people a year. With a population of 1.8 million, um, and again, a lot of us are exported across the water to Britain, uh, which I think is about 58 percent self-sufficient. So um, we do we do have uh, our emissions would be higher because we are um, a, a big food producing region, and also um, the fact that our farming here that we have a lot of small farms um, out in out in the hills. And dotted across, there's probably a um, a bigger network of small farms here. So, some of the some of the um, any of the changes that 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 you have been suggesting in terms of reduction to meat eating and uh, other issues would would cause um, a major major challenges uh, for the people's way of life here and how things are done. Um, one of the things I do want to pick up on is in terms of the fact that, that we are, we are on a, a single a single island here, and, and Susie, the researcher, mentioned that they're they're just there a month ago as well. You know the fact that um, we have a similar profile as farming in the south of Ireland. Um, what what thought has the CCC uh, given towards looking at the the island wide approach for here? You know for harmonising policies and targets across uh, the island of Ireland. And I do note that, you know, in the south of Ireland, that they do have sector-specific targets. 
um, and, they're, and they're trying to achieve net zero by 2050, uh, which is a different um, a different target set for us here in this part of the island. Well, we are very keen to work with um, the South. We, we have uh, proper connections with their equivalent. It's a slightly different and less powerful committee than ours, but it is um, uh, modelled to some extent on what we are doing. And uh, one of the things uh, since they've made some new appointments and such like is that we have done is to uh, reach out to them. And we're hoping to be able to have exactly the sort of discussions that you have. Of course, I'm very conscious if ever if ever anyone could be having had 16 years in, uh, as as a minister, um, how important it is that we tread uh, carefully because of the differences um, both between parties in the north um, and uh, the his the history, so that we don't want in any way to uh, act in a manner which makes things more difficult for you. But it is clearly true that so much of the economy of the two parts of Ireland um, are interlinked, that we really have to look as to the very best ways in which we can um, uh, help both sides to work together. Uh, it's no secret if I tell you that I myself am very, very sad that we have left the European Union because I think it makes it all very much more difficult. And uh, I always hesitate to say I told you so, but the issues that are now appearing uh, through the pro protocol and the like are exactly what I said would happen in these circumstances. But that still doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with the mistakes that we've made. And therefore, we've got to do the best we possibly can, and we shall do so. And we will look, Mr. McAleer, to you to give us guidance, you and your committee, to make sure that what we do is um, in conformity with how you want these things done and we will do our best to solve what is um, <laughs> a more difficult problem now than it was perhaps uh, three or four years ago. Well, well, I think just before I move around the room, the, um, well, I agree with you in relation to Brexit and that was the view of the majority of people in the north of Ireland as voted in the, re in the referendum, but unfortunately, has was not th that those views were not taken on board um, in terms of this region. But uh, nevertheless, um, but I would say that the issues of environment and indeed food production and processing transcends. Uh, the, the boundary that we have on this island uh, and tra tra transcends all boundaries. And, and if we take food pr food processing alone, you know, we export 800 million litres of milk a year down to the south. Uh, we export a half million sheep to the south and there's about half a million pigs uh, that are imported into the north. So food, uh, like like uh, our, our, even our whiskey is distilled right across the island of Ireland. So there is no border when it comes to food processing food production and there is no border when it comes to environment and 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 you know we do have political structures here for example you know the strand the you know the strand two of the good friday agreement which is the basis of uh, why we're here in terms of this committee and the assembly strand two is that there's very strong um north there's the north south ministerial council which meets in sectoral format as well so so i think that that would be absolutely crucial, you know, but, uh, because the nature of our farms and our food processing and, our, and um, the network that we have here, uh, uh, you know, it, it will probably predates partition, actually, uh, but certainly that there there is no boundary. And that's why I suppose it was important to have a protocol that that, that the, the food processing on the, on the island of Ireland uh, would... would could what be desert, that that couldn't be disrupted because it's so absolutely seamless and always has been seamless regardless of the the politics of here. So um, again, I, I just want to want to thank you, but just want to emphasise that that's a that's a crucial crucial aspect that that we must look at that as an island wide and of course you know east west as well. No question about that. Um, well, you I mean I'm I'm very very sympathetic with that. You remember that I was. Minister and Deputy Minister of Agriculture for um, uh, nine years before before devolution, so to speak. So, I mean, I was uh, in in a really direct way responsible for um, for what happened, and therefore I'm very well well aware um, not only of the uh, lack of a border, but of the huge importance of. Uh, 
keeping that like that because I remember the days of pig smuggling uh, and other matters which would go on. So um, uh, you you really do have an ally in trying to make sure that, 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 that we do things as well as possible between us. And obviously the EUTS and things of that sort, we have recommended we should be as close to that as possible, um, even if we were to leave it. I mean, we've got to find the best way of dealing with that. And it also, one does have to say this, that the environment doesn't have borders. I mean, half half the pollution in uh, England is blown over from the rest of Europe. And we export to them half the pollution that we produce. So the idea that you can have an air pollution policy or indeed a sea pollution policy, except on a common basis, is just nonsense. So we've got to find ways um, in the more restricted system that we have now uh, to be able to cooperate, and that I'm committed to. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, um, move the move around the room here. Um, Morris? Morris? Open Coleraine direction. Morris? Right. Yeah, there we go. You got me now, Chair. I'd just like to thank Lord Devon for his presentation. Uh, and I'd ask the, 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 the question earlier to, to Susie. So I would like to put it to uh, to him as well. And that and that would be, uh, what impact could the, the, the protocol have on our ability to reach net zero within the UK legislation, if indeed net zero is achievable for Northern Ireland? And how that impacts on Northern Ireland, considering our power suppliers are under EU law? Another wee point uh, is uh, capturing the ca capture or carbon capture. Mr. Pooch, in his role as minister, had embarked on a tree planting scheme uh, as part of his reforestation of Northern Ireland, uh, which could also help reduce Northern Ireland's carbon footprint. There are opportunities to increase native broadleaf planting and, where applicable, uh, coniferous plantations in the uplands. But this policy has been nullified by EU restrictions within the Northern Ireland protocol. So I was wondering if uh, the Climate Change Committee could put any pressure on the EU to relax their restrictions on the importation of plants into Northern Ireland, because it's vital to our whole programme. Well, just to take that uh, point first, Mr Bradley, um, we are obviously working uh, as hard as we can, uh, both with the government as a whole and indeed um, with our uh, relationships across Europe, because obviously we have uh, a particular, because we are entirely independent, um, uh, we uh, have a particularly good entry into most countries in Europe who have now, many of them, similar committees with whom we work. And we will be trying to do everything that we can because uh, they recognise that this is a matter in which we are all involved. And whatever the politics of removing ourselves from the European Union, the truth of the matter is that we've got to get this right together. And what you say is very important, and we will be pressing that uh, significantly, because your tree planting um, activities are crucial if you're to get anywhere near the level which we are talking about, even if we accept that it'll be more difficult for you than for other parts of, of, of the UK so, and, and uh, of Great Britain. Um, now, the, the next thing uh, is, as far as um, the protocol itself is concerned, the, the truth is, of course, that anything which is um, a restriction on doing things together, uh, anything that uh, accepts that there's a kind of dual position on the island of Ireland, I'm trying to use words that don't carry any particular view, um, it makes it more difficult for us and for you. Um, what we shall be doing is working out as far as we possibly can means of, of helping in that direction. In the end, of course, this is a matter for the government um, it is a matter for them to uh, negotiate and deal with. Uh, what is a problem, uh, frankly, of their own making? I mean, this is a problem that they have made by making a political decision which they decided to do. So they've, in fact, got to find a way through this. And it doesn't help it, I find, by, by blaming either side. I mean, the fact is that the United Kingdom has decided to withdraw from the European Union. That means that we have got to make the way um, to make that work. 
It's our job to do it, not the European Union. It's our job to do it. And we shall be doing everything we can to make it work, even though we wish we weren't here. So that's the situation. We'll, you'll find us very great allies, but we do have to say it's us that has to do it. And we can't just complain about other people because it's the position that we have chosen to be in. So we've got to find a way out of it. Um, and I shall do my best to do that, even though I wish I weren't asked to do that. But that's what I shall do. <laughs> Long-term politician, I have to accept that that's what I have to achieve. Well, thank you very much, well, Lord Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Philip? Philip? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure you gave Morris the answer he was, he, he was expecting there with the protocol, but you certainly will get a thumbs up from myself. Uh, so, so you will very, very, very sensible. I mean, you, I, I, I'm in the same political party as the chair, so you, you won't be surprised that you know. Again, I will labour the point, uh, you know, and, and probably should be contained within your advice about all Ireland cooperation because it does climate does go beyond uh, just agri food. You know, on this island, you know, obviously the uh, energy, same energy market, uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, tourism, you know, all of the kind of things that will impact on uh, climate, uh, there needs to be close cooperation uh, in, in terms of, of the island. Uh, so just to agree with the chair when he made that point. In terms of, the, you know, the, the position about the North not having net zero uh, and just contributing 82%, I mean, you'll be aware that the North is the only place on these islands that currently doesn't have uh, proposals or, or climate act or its own climate legislation, which is very disappointing, and hopefully that will change in the near future. So I, I'm wondering, is that that position of your committee based on you know pr a, pro a proven track record of lack of ambition here in the north, and even maybe uh, I mean I note that the current minister wrote to your committee uh, asking for advice relating to the North's fair contribution to the net zero, as opposed to asking for advice on how the North could actually come to its own net zero uh, position. So, I mean, I, I'm not being critical. I do think there's a lack of ambition. I do think if, if Scotland, Wales, the South and England can move towards net zero, then there, there's no reason why the North's population shouldn't be taking this issue as seriously and showing the same ambitions. Caveated, of course, by some of the, the things that, that you have said. So I just want to make that point. I mean, just in terms of kind of specifics, because, I mean, a lot of the discussion probably is laboured on agriculture and you, you have made uh, some points. I mean, I'm wondering, has your committee taken into account the potential contribution uh, grassland sequestration can make in offsetting emissions? Uh, I'm also wondering uh, if the committee has taken into account, you know, the, the potential that we have on this island for, you know, maybe moving in, in a faster direction with, you know, uh, for example, hydrogen uh, transport, uh, you know, the energy sector. And then just finally, in terms of the cost, I mean, th there's obviously a cost to this, although, I mean, we'll, or, or, or we propose that, you know, the business and community will eventually, you know, economically benefit from moving towards uh, everything green. Uh, but in, in the terms of the work of your committee, you know, what uh, consideration have you given to the cost, particularly for regard to the north uh, and in terms of maybe grants and payments that will kickstart this kind of change that's needed? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the um, argument that it is not um, um, as seemly as you would like it to be for the North of Ireland to be in this position. But my job as chairman of the Climate Change Committee fundamentally is to present um, that which can, with real difficulty, be achieved so that the governments of um, Ireland, uh, of, of uh, the north of, of uh, Wales, Scotland and, and, and England, are able genuinely to say to their population, by 2050, we can, without in any way destroying uh, the way of life which we have, we can reach that level. 
um, I need to do that because otherwise um, we will have people who will be saying, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die because we're not going to be able to achieve this. So I have to do that. And that's why we've given you that, not because we think that uh, we wouldn't much prefer a situation in which the whole island, island of Ireland uh, together were going to reach um, a, a net zero in, in 2050. But because our job is to tell you what we think can be uh, achieved and you can say to your population this really can be achieved, which means you've got to do it. And uh, we're not going to have any more complaints about people. Now, there is a history in the north of Ireland, as we know perfectly well, um, of people, first of all, not believing in climate change. There are still people going, talking about that, which is absolutely impossible to uphold. I mean, it isn't possible to uphold that view scientifically or in any other way, but there are those people who do do that. My first um, visit to you, uh, which was a real visit, I had to spend the first 10 minutes arguing the biblical basis for um, the fact of climate change. Happily, I was brought up in circumstances in which I can do that, um, <laughs> which at least made it possible to win. But the fact of the matter is, um, it isn't easy in the North uh, compared with other parts of the country. And I'm very pleased with the movements that have taken place. Um, and we will do everything in our power to help you do better than your target. But at least you know you can deliver the target at a cost which is overall in the United Kingdom, going to be less than 1% of our GNP. It's largely going to be paid for by the private sector and the sort of changes in the banking arrangements, such like the Chancellor announced yesterday, will show very clearly that the, the whole of the system will turn towards helping you. I mean, just to come in on that, I mean, obviously, uh, it, the point you made about uh, so, some people uh, being resistant to climate change is, is an obvious factor. I mean, our own minister, for example, made uh, probably disgraceful comments a, a, a while ago in relation to the subject. But it, you should be clear that the population as a whole is demanding change and is supportive of a climate act. The Assembly, in its first piece of business back declared a climate emergency. The majority of the parties, the majority of the population and the, uh, the majority of the assembly want a climate act and want to be very progressive on this subject. So I think, you know, that needs to be understood as well. Well, okay. I'm pleased about that. Certainly take that into account fully. Okay, we'll go okay. move on. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Lord Devon. We're going to move around to John Blair. Uh, Chair, thank you. And can I can I thank you, Lord Devon, as well, and your your colleagues for the uh, rather excellent presentation this morning. I, I want to to try and and focus on cross departmental responsibilities, and and to hear your thoughts on what we can do to have not <clears throat> merely cross -dep departmental targets alone, but to make them binding targets in achieving net zero or as close to it as we can get and how we can go about, uh, as those who legislate, ensuring that collective approach. And I'm asking that because I think that, I mean, obviously we're concentrating here this morning on agricultural matters. We're uh, drawing on your experience as an environment secretary also, but surely it is not unreasonable that departments like health or those responsible for communities should also be doing their own cost-benefit cost analysis of uh, social, economic, environmental impacts of not pursuing net zero targets together? Well, Mr. Bray, your, your question brings a very great pleasure to my heart because this is one of the biggest issues that we have throughout um, the United Kingdom. Um, it's too easy to say this is a matter for the environment department or for the agriculture department or for the um, business department. Actually, it's for every possible department yeah. uh, because climate change has actually got to be at the centre of all that we do, which is why we very much welcome the Chancellor's um, decision yesterday to tell the Bank of England that um, uh, net zero was now going to be at the heart of the decisions that it makes, because, of course, that makes a whole difference about investment and the like. Um, and uh, indeed, if you look at the North Island, I think there's some real issues there. Um, if I may take just simply the education department. I mean, we do need to have some very new uh, ways of uh, teaching people in order that they can 
get those new green jobs which are so necessary. The cost of not doing this is very, very much larger than the cost of doing it. But one of the costs of doing it is making sure that we have an education system which actually prepares young people to be able to take these new jobs. And you have a particular benefit in the in Northern Ireland in the sense that you both have a university basis and, and also a very, very high quality of education. And it's very important that your education department really uh, works to 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 provide the um, uh, the training and the like that we will need, and I do think that's one area where uh, Northern Ireland could lead the rest of the United Kingdom. I mean, I'm a great believer in in, in devolution. As a matter of fact, uh, it's very useful for me because I can go around the rest of the United Kingdom and say, why don't you do the waste as well as they do it in Wales? Um, why don't you do um, the uh, way of uh, reducing emissions on the roads as well as they're doing it in Scotland? In other words, there, there are good things that are being done everywhere, except actually, to be perfectly truthful, I'm not sure I can find very many examples in England, which is a different issue. So one is using that. Now, I think the area which, um, because of your history, one of the areas which you really could do a great uh, service to the rest of the United Kingdom is, is, is showing how your education department uh, can, your education facilities can really uh, uh, step up to the mark. But you're also absolutely right that it has to be in the Department of Health. It's got to be in the department. It's everybody. It's the cultural department. Everybody has a part to play. So you don't give a grant to a theatre unless the theatre has actually made sure that it's properly um, uh, it, 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 it's using less water and using less electricity. I mean, everything we do has got to be like that. And I think you're absolutely right to put your, your finger on that. So thank you for that response. If we can come back, Chair, just very, very quickly on, on the issue of education. Do you, do you believe also, you've given me an opportunity to ask that. I've been working uh, recently with, with a group, um, National Lottery funded group called Our Bright Future, made, made up of young people campaigning for environmentalism in education. Um, is there an argument, therefore, that environmentalism should be, should be uh, uh, themed through education curriculum, for example, uh, so that people have a better knowledge, there are qualifications in relation to this, not just skills uh, for new jobs, but also educational qualifications, so that people are prepared for the future in this regard. Well, it seems to me that um, we probably would agree that um, education has got to fit people for the world that they really live in and not some past world. And sometimes education looks as if it's preparing people for a world that's long past. And, and, and what we need to do is to prepare people for a world that is, that is here and is coming. Um, and therefore, these are the issues which are going to affect the next generation in a way which um, is otherwise uh, unimaginable. They, it really is absolutely necessary. And therefore, I agree with you. I think it has to infuse the whole of our education system, just as an understanding of the, um, of the future and what needs to be done. Um, in every other area, but it is the biggest threat to us. It is the thing that will dominate politics uh, throughout the world uh, as we try to rise to this human challenge. Um, and it's something which will also affect the way we look at all the rest of life. I mean, I am, if I may uh, dare say this, um, uh, I am very, very keen on Laudato Si, the Pope's um, statement about these issues. And at the heart of that is a very simple comment in which he says that um, climate change is the symptom of the disease. It's the symptom of what we've done to the world. Yeah. And therefore, that is a crucially important concept, which I think should be at the centre of our educational system, so that people realise that biodiversity and its protection, uh, bringing, um, enabling the, the, the soil to be more fertile, because we've taken the fertility out of the soil and we put it back in order that it can uh, bring uh, sequestrate uh, carbon, uh, uh, growing trees and, and, and recognizing the value that that to health and people's uh, uh, mental well-being, all those things are part of the same story. And that ought to be at the heart of the way in which we teach. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, John, okay, we'll move around to Pate. Pate? I'd say, can you come on? Yeah, we got you, Patrick. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, first uh, Lord Evan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm really enjoying your your uh, your uh, 
your deliverances to us there. And uh, thank you for all your hard work and what you've done in bringing us to this point. Now, um, I, I enjoyed your quote there from the Pope, but there's, there's another quote that was running through my head as you were speaking about environmental issues and green issues, and that is that no man is an island. And you probably know the rest of it, which, about the conflict, which could take us into another argument, but we'll not go there. But specifically, um, two, two issues that I would like to raise with you, <clears throat> which are peculiar and well, not peculiar, but specific to Northern Ireland. Um, the first one is the agricultural issues and the prevalence of agriculture in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> Excuse me. I represent a rural constituency here where agri-food is very, very important. Now, I was interested to hear what you were saying about cheap importations that could flood, uh, well, if, if it were not regulated and not prevented, that could potentially flood, flood the market here and undermine our existing high quality food production and the high standards of food production that we have in Northern Ireland, indeed within the island, as as uh, Declan referred to. Um, can you advise just what measures that, because those cheap importations, they come at a price, they come at a very cheap price, and that can be in terms of the standards that are adhered to in other countries, the standards of production, the standards of indeed how people are paid, and uh, the practices that are, that are engaged in to arrive at that low price uh, foodstuffs. Um, that's the first thing. And w how you see your climate change committee um, working within that, A, to ensure that standards are adhered to here, which is a good thing for consumers, but B, to ensure that the market isn't flooded with cheap foodstuffs that basically undermine those high, high quality and high standards that we have and wish to adhere to. Now, um, if I can just roll on from there, um, part of where we live too is um, the uh, rural transport network is very, very inadequate. And there's a heavy reliance on cars for that. So with that, in order to, to move to public transport, to move to a new system of transport to ensure that people get their places of work um, and indeed schools and that, we need to look at that in a better, more holistic way in terms of the overall uh, investment that's required uh, to move to a different way of transportation that reduces the emissions and the impact upon our environment. So I'd like to hear from you on that, what your, your deliberations are on that. And then finally, just and this, and this is a more uh, important issue that has been foisted upon us um, by the uh, pandemic, and that's the societal changes in regard to working from home and the impact of that, the beneficial impact of that, that could be in regard to uh, reduction of emissions into the into the into the climate, into the atmosphere, and what sort of thought you've you've given to that, or indeed research that you you've looked at to encourage and support those people who wish to work from home and who can work from home as part of, if you like, uh, an environmentally friendly change to how we work and to the economy. So, uh, thank you indeed. Well, uh, if I answer the first question and then uh, hand the second to uh, Chris Stark, the uh, discussion on transport and then the societal change, I'd like to pass to Keith Bell, who is uh, specifically charged with um, looking after the interests of, uh, of Northern Ireland and has some uh, very close contacts, fam family contacts here. So we, we very much rely on his, his help in that sense. Um, as far as agriculture is concerned, um, I, I mean, I have a very clear view the, the world is increasingly moving to a situation in which um, most sensible countries are not only signed up to dealing with climate change, but are actually dealing with it. So we are all trying um, in some of us in different ways, but all together in pretty similar ways to, to reach this. This is why the net zero is um, a, a, a target. Um, acceptance by so many countries is so important. Um, in those circumstances, we really do have to say that those who are not trying to do that really cannot take advantage of their failure to do it. So let me take a single example, Brazil. 
Brazil is doing the opposite of uh, trying to do that. It's actually making it more difficult for us by by uh, allowing and contributing to cutting down the rainforest by reversing its previous policies. And and Mr. Bolsonaro is a dangerous activist in the other side. So why we should support that by importing product um, from them in a way which undermines our own business seems to me to be intolerable. And it's also true that we have to be realistic about this. So one of the problems in Britain as a whole, um, uh, and that includes uh, Northern Ireland, um, one of the problems is that we take too much for granted the fact that the United States happens to speak the same language and therefore we think it works in the same way. But, you know, it has more than twice as many foodborne diseases that we do because it just doesn't have the same standards of safety. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a country which um, has the largest um, support for per farm in the world. You talk about the European Union being a so CAP. The CAP is nothing like a strong per farm. Indeed, at one time, they were subsidizing um, cotton, for example, by three times the actual value of the cotton. So you can see that we do have to recognize that we're not dealing on a, on a level playing field in these circumstances. And I think that it is it would be really serious if we ever uh, told our people that they should be working towards a global target um, with their hands tied behind their back because we were importing stuff from countries that were not doing their job yes. properly. And so uh, it's not just a question of getting the same targets. It's a question also of recognizing the same standards. And agriculture and food production are crucial to that. Animal welfare, safety, and, and of course, uh, the use of uh, hormones and, uh, and all sorts of other things. And indeed, the damaging chemicals, which are the reasons that we have lost our fertility. Because if that happens in other countries, they are not taking the, the, the sequestering the carbon. And we've got a bigger problem. So we are in this all together. And that means having an attitude towards this, which is as I described. But if we turn to transport, which is a very important issue, perhaps I can ask Chris to, to have a word on, on your question there. Chris. Yes, thank you. And hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. There we can. Yes, go for it, Chris. Great. Well, let me just say a very short word on, on surface transport. And um, uh, surface transport is a, is a really, really important issue when we consider what we've got to do to cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in Northern Ireland. It's the second uh, largest of the Northern Irish sources of emissions behind agriculture. Now, the really interesting and I think exciting story on transport is that we used to think, uh, let's say a decade ago, of, tr of, the, of the challenge of decarbonising transport as one of the toughest challenges. Uh, we're using very convenient fuel with... Uh, it looked like it was going to be quite an expensive transition petrol and diesel vehicles on, on, on our roads. Now, there's been a really... Chris, sorry, we're, you, uh, maybe you could switch off your video. We might be able to hear your words more clearly. Yeah. So, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Keith, Keith why don't you pick it? If, I, if my sound call... Go ahead. Well, I, yeah, why don't you go ahead, um, Keith, because you are able to do that. So why don't you go ahead? And uh, I'm afraid we leave Steve, uh, leave, <laughs> leave Chris out of it. So, uh, Keith, would you go, please? Yeah, no problem at all. And I'm delighted to meet everybody this morning. Uh, so, I mean, as Lord Deaver mentioned, uh, as a member of the committee, uh, one of my responsibilities there is to take a particular interest in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, so I'll just briefly introduce myself. I joined the committee in April 2019. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, like all the other members of the committee, I'm, I'm a part-time uh, part worker for the committee and uh, occupies uh, sort of a proportion of my working week. The rest of my working week, I'm a power systems engineer at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Uh, so I think pick up the points that's, that Chris was making there about transport. Yeah, we've got huge opportunities because we now realize that electric vehicles, depending on what your mileage is and what your kind of regular patterns of use are, already look cost competitive with combustion engine vehicles. Uh, okay, there's a dependency there and it depends on what you're paying for the fuel and fuel duty and, and so on. Uh, and in terms of emissions reduction, they're much better. 
Uh, so we already have on the island of Ireland and in the rest of the UK, uh, in you know in Scotland in particular where I'm where I'm living, the electricity production is extremely low carbon. There's there's more to go, so you can be sure that the electricity you're using in your vehicle in your electric vehicle really is low carbon, and the range is increasing, and particularly the battery costs have come down massively. So we've got real opportunities there, and in fact some of the uh, work that that we did in the CCC for the sixth carbon budget and advice shows that over the medium to long term, actually, it's a cost saving. The big challenge in the short term, of course, is the capital cost. The upfront cost of electric vehicles is, is still pretty high, even if you have savings in terms of your fuel costs over time. And you need to have confidence in the charging infrastructure that when you need to charge a vehicle, you can. Uh, and you can know that it's in, in service and available. So there's still things to be done there. The other issue about transport, I think, is just re reducing the need for transport. I think it's been alluded to there, um, Mr. McGlone, in terms of what you were saying about working from home. So we've got the opportunity there to have to, we don't have to move as much. Those of us have kind of got the luxury, if you like, of having a job that we can do from home. And of course, we've got to be conscious of the fact that not everyone is in that position. Yeah. We should be taking more advantage of that ability to work from home. And we need to make that as easy as possible. So investment in broadband isn't in every respect an alternative to investment in roads, but it's certainly something that delivers enormous benefits. And it's got to be seen as a kind of a, a, a widespread, uh, you know, good thing to do. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think, I think those transport issues, you can see the two things coming together. Provision of local services is another aspect of reducing the need for transport, uh, making sure that there's easy availability so you don't have to get in the car uh, quite as much as maybe we do, uh, do nowadays. The other point I think, uh, Lord Deben, that, that uh, we were going to pick up there in response to your question, Mr. McGlone, was, was about you know, societal choices. And I think a large part of that is down to providing the information to consumers, you know, us as individuals, but also you know, organizations and businesses and parts of the public sector that are themselves consumers of products and services so that they're well informed about the kinds of choices that they can make. So I think there's a kind of regulatory dimension to that about obliging the provision of information in a clear way that can be easily interpreted uh, and, and acted upon. I think there's a dimension there that links back to a previous discussion we were having with, with, uh, with Mr. Blair uh, about education. So you know, we're talking about part of the curriculum, so just kind of a kind of climate literacy. So people being, uh, being able to understand what these kind of trade-offs and choices mean, I think is a really important part of this as well. Okay. 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 Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Lord Devon and Chris Keith, good to see you. Good to meet you. Thanks for being in attendance today. I'm just wondering, Lord Devon, is there an economic benefit to moving towards net zero and can this be quantified? Just for a first question. Thank you. Well, we, we have quantified quite a lot of the economic benefits. And um, indeed, the, uh, we, we do have, let me be frank with you, um, Mr. Harvey, we do have a problem here because um, the truth is that people very rarely look at the economic benefits in the right way. Yeah. First of all, we have to say, what is your benefit? Go for Lord uh, Devon. Sorry, go, go ahead, Lord Devon. Thank you. Um, there's something, something is, uh, I think, come in or done because mine was all right before, I think. But um, I'll try. Um, first of all, we've got to compare um, what the economic situation would be if we didn't do this. Um, because that's the alternative, isn't it? The alternative is not to do this, but to allow the world to go as it was. In that case, there's a huge economic benefit of doing it, this, because the new jobs that we will get will be in the world, in in in, uh, in green uh, business. Um, we won't be able to export things unless we show that we are, in fact, contributing to the world battle about uh, climate change. Um, and uh, the circumstances uh, will be, in fact, uh, much weighted against us because the countries that are doing things are going to do in precisely the way that I answered uh, a previous questioner. They're not going to allow people to be exporting stuff which they, when they are not carrying part of the burden. 
So there, we first have to compare what happens if we don't do anything with what uh, is the value of doing it. And secondly, we have to look at the economic cost in any case. And as I said, it's less than 1% of the GNP. Um, but as we look at it, as the years go on towards 2050, we're finding that we're getting actual advantages, real advantages from that. So that in fact, instead of it costing us money, we're actually earning from it. And the example which um, Chris started to give and which uh, Keith completed of the electric car is exactly that. To start with, we have to pay for um, a proper um, system of being able to plug the things in. To start with, they are more expensive to buy. But actually, an electric car is much less expensive to run, not only because of the energy, but also because, of course, as you well know, there are very few, many fewer moving parts. And therefore, you don't have to go and take it round to the garage as often as you do with another sort of car. Now, that has a knock-on effect, but the garage has got to do a different kind of job. And what is that? job and how is that dealt with and therefore i suppose i come to that third point which is simply this it's clearly going to be cheaper to do this than not to do it it's clearly going to be cheaper to do it than anybody thought it was going to be and it will increasingly contribute to the economy but the third point is simply this it depends on how we do it and that's why we're very keen on the just transition that's why i talked a bit about agriculture and the particular problems of the north of Ireland. The, the truth is we cannot have a situation in which the poorest pay most. And that, of course, is what we have at the moment, because if you're on the gas grid, you don't pay anything towards the big changes we've made uh, on your gas bill. You only pay it on your electric bill, whereas all those people in the north of Ireland who have an electric bill and aren't on the gas bill are paying proportionately more. And that is a real issue. And it's that those changes which we've got to make to make sure that the poorest are properly protected. Um, and that's why I'm always using the, the word just. It is a just transition. And being fair is a very British concept, isn't it? You, we, we are very keen on being fair, and that's what we have to be if we're going to get the full economic advantages from this. Okay, yep, thank you very much, Lord Devon. That's um, excellent answers. Maybe a wee question for or Keith there. On electric vehicles, do you say that even if, um, with more emissions being created, obviously with more and ports being put up all over the place, um, there's obviously going to be a lot more electric consumed. Are you saying that that won't create um, more emissions? And what about the manufacture and disposal of the batteries? What risks are involved there? Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, the good news, as I was mentioning earlier, is that the supply of the energy for your electric vehicle is increasingly low carbon. So, uh, you know, the island of Ireland has done fantastically well in decarbonizing its electricity system. Um, there's an exchange of electricity between the island of Ireland and, and Great Britain. And, and in Britain, we're kind of following the, the example, really, and actually learning a lot of lessons from, from how that's been going in terms of uh, electricity decarbonization. Uh, Yes, you're right that there are issues around the kind of manufacture and uh, disposal of some of the kind of components of electric vehicles. I think uh, you know, the good news is that a lot of, lot of research is going on to improve what's happening there to develop access to alternative materials, uh, to be much more conscious of the way in which the existing materials are extracted and processed. I know there's also a lot of work going on in terms of the recycling of the materials. So there are companies that already will take lithium-ion batteries and, and uh, refurbish and refurbish them as much as possible and, and try to recycle uh, individual materials. So there's room for improvement. Now, actually, you could say, oh, well, you know, we haven't got there yet. That's bad. But the fact that there is room for improvement and that it's being pursued, uh, I think is good. So uh, it, it can't be claimed to be a panacea, I think, you know, electric vehicles, but definitely they are, uh, you know, that's a vehicle moving in the right direction. Just a wee final one, maybe, Chair. Is there any risks to health um, sitting on top of an electric vehicle? Um, I know, obviously, at the minute we can't do it for very long because the range is short, but are there any risks involved with being close to an electric motor? Just to finish, thank you. 
Well, none, none that, uh, that anyone knows of. Um, I don't think there are any at all. And certainly there must be less risk than sitting on the top of uh, something which is uh, highly flammable. I mean, if you try to produce a, a, the um, internal combustion engine today and you said, what I want you to do is to sit on a tank which would blow up if uh, anything hit it, um, or certainly if a flame got near it. Um, every health and safety organization in the world would stop uh, the provision of um, uh, internal combustion engines. This is very, very much safer than that. <laughs> I think we could add there just the, the, the huge health benefits that would come from the reduction of the emissions, especially especially associated with with diesel engines, uh, you know, in, yes. in in built up areas. You know, huge advantages to come from reducing those kinds of emissions. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, okay, we're going to move around to County Fermanagh, Rosemary. Rosemary, you you're. My, Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your presentation. I found it very interesting. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Right. Um, I have a couple of, couple of questions. Um, I've listened closely to what's been said. Sometimes I think there is a slight conflict between the some of the economic decisions taken and the climate change issues. For example, as, as Declan said, I'm living in a rural area, Fermanagh. We have listened over the past week or so to banks closing in our town. We listened to schools closing in Fermanagh again, schools closing in our towns. You know, the implications that has for transport, people having, for example, people with the nearest bank 25, 30 mile away. That's, that's a huge problem. We have children, some of them traveling 25, 30 miles to schools, there and back again. And, you know, I don't think those are in the best, those are in the best interests of climate change with regard to our transport. And yes, you, and yet you talk about electric vehicles again, or 100 miles early. Electric vehicles aren't very good. You're not going to stop at half past 10 at night coming from the assembly to have it recharged or things like that. So you have, there are there are issues, many issues that still need to be looked at. And I'm just wondering, you know, is there, what sort of consideration has been given or needs to be given between the economy and the issues in relation to climate change? Well, I think um, uh, you've put your finger on a hugely important thing. And, and can I suggest that uh, we are in a better position today than we have been for a long time? Because as um, uh, someone else asked in their question, the, the, the truth is that what the virus has done is to make us recognize how much we can do uh, from home. Uh, and how much we have wasted our time wandering around the place when we don't need to do that any longer. I mean, what we've been doing today has been just as convenient as if we had been in front of each other, probably more so for everybody. And we've all worked in this way, and it is a very good way of working. Now, because of that, it seems to me that you put that together with the fact that um, it's more and more easy to do things on a devolved basis for all sorts of things. I think there'll be much more education on a devolved basis so that, for example, uh, we've closed rural schools on the basis that you can't really deal with those number of children because you've only got two teachers and that's not enough really to cover the age range and all the rest of it. Well, perhaps with uh, modern technology, it will be enough to cover the age range because you will be using the teacher. Of course, it's got to be a personal connection, but you'll also be using uh, all the benefits of the Internet and the way in which we can actually teach uh, at distance. I mean, I've been doing a lot of homeschooling for my um, uh, six-year-old grandson who is locked down with me and his parents and um, I find that it has been wonderfully uh, good to be able to 
teach him things which I don't know much about, but which the internet helps me to do that. So some of the subjects which I've taught him are things which I know about, but others I've been able to do in a way would, I would never have been able to do before because of that access. So I do believe that is going to be a huge difference. Um, I do also take your point about banks and others, but then I think one of the things that happened with COVID is that we've all learned to benefit from and to, I think, um, respect the local services that we were very often uh, rushing off to some supermarket some way away. We found that the village shop really matters. And I hope that that will continue to be our attitude. And there are so many more things we can now do with um, overnight deliveries. We can actually do all kinds of things to make the village shop a real center for things which you can collect and buy from it in a way which we haven't been able to do before. So I totally agree with you that there very often seems to be that conflict. Ministers, uh, members of uh, parliament, members of uh, national parliaments. I think we've all of us got to think of ways of, of, re of, re uh, of renewing uh, local community facilities um, in a way which modern technology makes possible. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, another, another question in relation to animals. Has and we all know how they contribute to um, the, the necessary change that are what has to be brought about in climate change. But what I, what I want to ask is, has much research been done in relation to animals and their foodstuffs and what they eat? For example, a beef animal differs from what differs, has differing needs to a dairy animal, et cetera, et cetera, in relation to the problems that of the climate? Yes, there is a good deal of work, nothing like as much as needs to be done. Um, New Zealand has um, uh, led that, and I recently had a virtual visit to New Zealand, uh, which having done real visits to New Zealand, I tell you are very much more comfortable than actually that long journey to New Zealand. But in those discussions, we've been encouraging New Zealand to use the work that it has already done and to spread that more widely. But fundamentally, one does have to say that um, the tendency to move to feedlots and to feed uh, animals um, food which they don't naturally have uh, needs to be reversed. And I see a great future for the island of Ireland uh, to have a reputation which it will not need much change to have. But if you buy meat from um, Ireland, it has been very naturally brought up with the lowest carbon footprint that there can be. And you may pay more for it, but you pay more for it because it's better for you. And I think that will make a big difference. And you will be in a stronger position when it comes to have to compete with artificially produced meat. And I do think we have to recognize that that's not all that far off. And then we will, we who produce, and I say we because I do, we who produce meat have really got to be able to say to the customer, ah, but ours is real meat, it's properly grown and with the real welfare standards without additional um, uh, 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 Chemi chemicals, and, and it's pasteurized in the sense that it's pasteurized, that the animals eat pasture in a natural and normal way. If we, if we do that, I think we've got a really good future. And at the same time, we'll be contributing to the battle against climate change. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Again, uh, William? Okay, am I, can you hear me okay? Yeah, very well. Okay, Lord Devon, uh, Chris and Keith, good to have you. Uh, can I say I'm a farmer all my life, um, partner in the farm business with my son and my wife, and uh, it's good to hear someone like yourself that has a wealth of knowledge in agriculture in Northern Ireland and how we, how we tick in Northern Ireland. Uh, we have a vibrant agriculture sector in Northern Ireland, uh, and for that reason, I think it's important that we don't set targets that damages the future of agriculture. I think you, you did touch on it earlier. It would be a travesty if we were to allow our agriculture to be 
damaging on the other hand import from Brazil and countries that are really damaging uh, the environment. I know our contribution, while it, it has to be addressed, is quite low and I think it's something like global emissions that we represent contribute to something like 0.04 percent but can you tell me will the a climate change bill be amendable uh, to take into consideration advances in technology and the new scientific research well um the the way in which you produce your climate change bill will will of course is not uh, not a direct responsibility for ours but if so i will take it more widely and that is that um, we have under the Act a responsibility for taking into account every new development of warning the government, if that's the right word, I'm saying telling the government of new developments which they ought to take into account. And we are very uh, precise about that. And we do try to do that effectively. And indeed, I think it's true to say that the, the strength and, and, and international reputation of the Climate Change Committee, which is now very strong indeed, is really based upon our absolute commitment to the science and not just the science in general but to the latest science that we can uh, that we can gather and my whole team um, led by Chris is 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 absolutely concentrated on that so you need not have a worry that we're going to miss out on anything new that can help us um, my only comment to say to you um, uh, mr. Irwin uh, is uh, what you say is entirely true but it must not be used as an excuse for not doing what ag agriculture can do. And one of the dangers we find, and I will use an example which you will allow me to use, it's not about uh, the Northern Ireland, but it's about uh, England. The National Farmers Union have got a net zero um, program, which isn't net zero at all. Um, they have uh, tried to use their own emission reductions as if they own them. And therefore, it's a sort of double counting system. And I have to say, we can't do it that way. We really do have to recognize that the reductions we have to make, we make for the whole community, and we can't then apply those and double, and double count them. What we have to do is do what we can do. So if we take um, the industry in the North Island, one of the things that we should be doing um, is recognizing that there we've got to reduce the amount of uh, uh, of uh, diesel we use. We've got to move over to alternatives as rapidly as we can, because those are things we can do something about. Um, and then, as far as animals are concerned, we have to think strongly, very carefully about the way in which we keep them, and and do all the things that are possible. And when we've done all the things that are possible and when we've shown that we're really enthusiastic about doing that, then it seems to me that it is much easier for the rest of the community to provide the means whereby you don't have to do things that, do, that damage the agricultural economy of uh, Northern Ireland. So it's, it's a sort of deal. The deal is you do everything you possibly can do, and we do what we can to make it possible for you to do less than you would otherwise have to do because other people do more than they need to do. So it's a quite tough thing to do, but the one thing that would let the agricultural uh, community down is the way that some people talk. There's a, there's a columnist in, the, in Farmers Weekly who does this on a weekly basis, constantly moaning about why agriculture can't have everything. Well, I'm afraid it can't. And I say that as a farmer, and, and I'm totally committed to this. It always, my, the thing I always wanted to be able to do, it's right at the heart of my belief. My son is very much uh, the activist now in this, and I'm thrilled that that is the case. And the first word that my new uh, grandson may, uh, said was tractor. So I want to say I'm absolutely on your side, but let's not allow people to beat us about the ears because we're not doing everything we can do. Yeah, but I think most farmers do want to play their part, but I, I think it's important that targets that are achievable are set and, and not unrealistic targets that, that leave us at a big disadvantage. I think the vast majority of farmers will are adaptable and... Uh, are prepared for, to change and do things in a way that will help. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, there. Eric, can you hear me okay? 
Yes, sir. Um, and thank you also to Lord Devon for meeting with us today and uh, for your time and also Chris and Keith, good to see you as well. Um, and these are, of course, the discussions that we need to be placing front and centre. So I'm really glad to be having them, um, even if it is a brief one today. Um, but I, I, while I do welcome the sixth report from the CCC, I, I do have to say that I am disappointed that the 82% carbon reduction target was given in that report, um, given such prominence. I know that you went on to say uh, and clarify that there's no reason that Northern Ireland cannot achieve net zero. But um, of course, as you know, Northern Ireland also has no climate change act of its own. Um, and the minister has gone uh, and had a brief consultation on um, producing one after a private members bill was lodged uh, as a climate change act. Um, but that, was, and that has been supported by six parties in the assembly plus independent um, MLAs. But in that consultation, um, the 82% target has been used as a scientific or evidence-based assessment um, versus what has been called an aspiration or non-scientific-led net zero aspiration or approach. So that's really um, where my disappointment lies by giving legitimacy to other discussion or other um, avenues, I suppose, um, because that 82% is really predicated on maintaining the agri-food production at much the same level um, that we have at the minute, which we know is unsustainable, and in my opinion, is not a fair share equivalence for Northern Ireland. Um, but it also jars with your initial summing up, Lord Devon, when you were stressing the urgency of where we are now and the deep systemic change that we really do need to, to embed. So on the back of that one, I mean, we can see already just even in this discussion, you know, how much there is to do to get even politicians just to understand what it is we're facing um, and how we need to overcome those. So my second point I want to raise really is to ask um, from yourselves is if we can continue to allow political systems and governments to embed and achieve what's needed to be done. Because in my view, we need nothing short of a new constitutional agreement between people and governments. But that's not in the way that Northern Ireland would normally understand constitutional agreements. Um, and, and how do we begin to build that with civic society, with people? How do we make this a bottom-up approach and get civic buy-in for what's needed to give permission, I suppose, to either lobbyists or objections or political systems that don't understand where we need to go? Is there anything that the CCC can do, for example, in order to embed, achieve or start civic assemblies or civic engagement processes to build the support needed? Well, can I approach this from answering the second question first? And um, I am a very, very considerable supporter of um, working uh, with citizens. Uh, as you know, we uh, um, have been the progenitor of a system which is now funded by the government to some extent, which uh, actually promotes this. And I am the chairman of um, uh, a thing called PCAN, and one of our uh, operations is in Belfast, where we are working with, um, uh, where Belfast uh, is working with the university, the city is working with the university and with the wider civic community in order to create the equivalent of a climate change committee. It's a climate change commission um, in order to make sure that you do locally what is necessary to do locally to meet the central demand for the Climate Change Committee. And we're doing that in a number of uh, cities. We've got um, funding to be able to do that. And we can, we, we're doing it in Edinburgh. We're doing it in uh, Belfast. We're, we're doing it um, uh, also in Leeds, uh, uh, in um, Bristol. It's happening in Cambridge, in Manchester, in Liverpool, a whole range of places where we've been able either fully or partially to support that. So I do see that, and I think it would be very valuable if um, uh, similar kinds of arrangements should be made. We're, we're doing it on regional basis too, so the West Midlands or, or particular parts um, where they come together, where there's a rural area, um, we're hoping that that's the way forward. And I think in, in um, 
uh, as far as uh, Northern Ireland is concerned, it would be very helpful if that were extended and that could be done locally. And there's no reason why um, your second university, I don't mean second to the other, but just the other university also did the same as Belfast is doing so that you were actually um, uh, spreading that because it's a very good stretch of the arrangements. You have the academic um, rigor, you have the local authority with its understanding of how you do these things, and it's a whole community with raising its standards. And of course, it's hugely important for the churches and local organizations to be joined in this. I, I opened the one in Leeds about two years ago, and it was remarkably good to see the Church of England, the Catholic Church, the um, uh, nonconformists, the, the trade unions, the, the business communities, everybody working together on that. And it is a really important element that we can, that, 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 that we can do. And so very much so. Um, Chris uh, has played a, a really important part in the Citizens' Assembly. So we really have uh, contributed as much as we possibly can to that. And we have actually acknowledged the work they did in our sixth carbon budget. So we're entirely on your side as far as that is concerned. Now, um, I have a I have a, just a, a, a point to make about the the problem I have with the way in which you think about this. And I had this discussion with a colleague of yours, actually, uh, Bailey, um, uh, which was um, with the, one of the two Green members of the House of Lords. And Natalie and I had uh, a, a really good argument uh, yesterday um, in front of an audience. And, and what I tried to say is, is simply this. Um, every party has got um, a, a form of, of how they see um, uh, society. And the Green Party has a particular form of seeing society. Um, and it's also very keen on green issues. So they're not quite the same thing. The form of society the Green Party feels is the best way of delivering those green issues. Other parties have a different form of society, but may be committed to those green issues. And what is important for all of us is to recognize that we, the most important thing is to achieve in the circumstances in which we live, the maximum that we can achieve day by day, week by week, and year by year. And so uh, I'm not prepared to um, uh, have an argument with a uh, socialist who wants to run everything from the state. Uh, all I'm saying is that what we've got at the moment is a system and I want to make that system work as well as possible. And in making it work, no doubt we will find changes we need to make in that system. And I'm perfectly happy for people to go for further changes and, and work for that. But let's not fall out on, on moving as fast as we can <laughs> along the lines which we can do within the system. Men, you and I, I'm sure, wish we were not in a position in which we had left the European Union. We wish that were so, but we have. So we have to work within that concept, uh, in that context. So what I hope you would accept is that, uh, although I think you and I probably would have a much closer understanding and belief in the sort of system that you're you're thinking about let's let's get let's get there by by changing whatever we can change in the world in which we we have at the moment now i just i am apologetic i have to say about the um uh, the target for the north Island. it's because my job is to challenge the various parts of the united kingdom um, with a target which they cannot say they cannot reach. Now, if you turn to me and say we can do better than that, nobody will be happier than I. But what nobody in the north of Ireland can say is that you can't reach what we've asked for. So that cuts out those, and there are those, as you well know, in the north of Ireland who really don't want to do it and or don't think it's necessary. None of them can say we're asking you to do something you can't do. If you internally, as the very first questioner or second questioner I had uh, said, if you internally say, look, we don't want to be second, we don't want to be behind other people, we're going to do, we're going to do the net zero, 
you will have our total support and we will do everything in, in our power to help you do that. But what we have offered you is something which enables you, Claire Bailey, to say to anybody who's saying to you, you're extremist, you're out of it, to say to you, no, what we've been asked for, we can do. What I'm saying is, I think we can do better. That ought to give you a very good, very good role to play. Thank you, Lord Devon. I give you my promise that yes, we can do better, and I'll do everything we can to make sure that we do do better. <laughs> Thank you. Well very good. Keith, do you want to add to that? No, I think uh, the. The ambition to do better is extremely welcome. And uh, that's, yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. I, I temporarily got cut off there, so I did, so hopefully didn't miss too much. Um, so that was the, that's the last of our speakers. So I would like to just um, take this opportunity and just to double check and that's the last, the, yeah, it is. I'd like to take this opportunity, um, uh, Lord uh, Dibbon and Keith, and Chris uh, for you coming on here this morning. I have to say, I think we all find it very refreshing and very frank exchange, and we really, really appreciate that. And certainly we would uh, look look forward to future engagements with you because it was very, I have to say, enlightening and very, very interesting. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, sorry, we're into the afternoon now, sir, and uh, we hope to be seeing you again. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and we much enjoyed it ourselves. Thank you. Yes, yes. thank you indeed. See you again. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, members, uh, we're moving on right now to number nine on the agenda. That's a, a written briefing, uh, a written briefing on the direct payment to farmers amendment regulations 2021. Papers are page 687 in the pack, and uh, for no, as for noting only, we can advise members that the committee considered the regulations at the SL1 stage at the meeting on the 18th of February, where members agreed that they were content with the merge of the policy and that it should continue to the next legislative stage. The regulations were debated in the Assembly on the 22nd of February and subsequently affirmed coming into operation on the 23rd of February. Are members content to note this? Okay. Can members, can members hear me? Can you hear me all right, members? Yeah. Okay. There must be technical difficulties going on because uh, uh, I felt I was alone there for a second. Uh, okay, members. Um, item 10 on the agenda. Uh, Claire's gone pixelated again, so she has. But um, so you blend in well with the, the pictures behind you there. Uh, <laughs> I see. Uh, okay. So, I don't understand, uh, written briefing, the direct payments to farmer simplification regulations, NA 2021. The papers from the department at page 687 and are for noting. Um, the uh, wise members of the committee are consider, considered the regulations at the SL1 stage at the meeting on the 18th of February, where members uh, where members agreed that they were content with the merits of the policy and that it should continue to the next legislative stage. Regulations were debated in the Assembly on the 22nd of February and subsequently affirmed commander operation on the 23rd of February. February. Are we okay to note this, members? Okay. Uh, item number 11. Um, item number 11 is the uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, update. I uh, want to refer members to the written briefing at page uh, 717. All right. Okay. Uh, facts there. Uh, okay, there. okay, can we turn that all the uh, stuff off, please? Um, okay, uh, so hello, members, please mute for feedback. Yeah, can all members please mute because we're getting a lot of feedback here. Okay. Okay, so in addition to that, yeah, can members forward anything that they have to sell up by the close of play today? Okay. Okay, cor correspondence members on um, page item number 12 on your backs, uh, page, page 727, item 12 on the agenda. Are members content to action the correspondence 
I suggest in the index, page 728. Okay. So, members, item number 13 is the forward work program. Uh, one of our members, can members all mute, please? Apart from myself, <laughs> um, one of our members to the forward work program, page 751. One of these members of the OEP has requested that the informal meeting of the committee on the 11th of March is deferred until the 15th of April uh, at half past two. Uh, are members okay with this arrangement? Okay. Uh, I draw members' attention to the following. 18th of March will be a committee discussion and arrangements for the joint meeting to take evidence from the TSS and the HMRC. Wednesday, 24th of March, 10 a.m. to 12, a joint meeting with the committees for economy and infrastructure to evidence from TSS and HMRC. 29th of April, there will be an oral evidence from the DERA on the budget 2021-22 and June monitoring. 6th of May, oral evidence DERA on nature-friendly farming. Consideration of written evidence on nature-friendly farming has been moved to this date to accommodate the budget. 20, briefing, 20th of May, oral evidence from DERA on the proposals for the Farm Welfare Bill a raised presentation on the proposal for Farm Welfare Bill, which were deferred from today's meeting to facilitate the, bring, the briefing with the Permanent Secretary. On the 27th of May is a committee consideration of evidence on nature friendly farming. Uh, are we okay on the Farm Work Program? Members okay with that? Okay. Um, before we conclude, members, I don't know, 14, are there any other uh, issues that members want to uh, raise before we uh, adjourn? <laughs> yes, William? Uh, no, just to check with maybe the, uh, Stella could tell us there, uh, in relation to uh, the independent panels issue, did the Farmers Union, did they, did they come forward with a written briefing? Did we get a written briefing on that, did we, from them? Or, or I think they will, were to present a written briefing on that issue, I think. Am I right or wrong, Stella? They were too. I'll check up. I haven't seen one, uh, William, but I'll check up on that and get back to you. Okay. Are we? Are we some coming to the committee next week in relation to that, or is that what we? Not from the union. It was in the app to come. Yes, no? William. That's, no, William. That's that's correct. That is next week. We have um, agricultural consultants association and NIAPA. Yeah, they're coming. Yes. They are. Or there, yeah, yeah, the presentation. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Um, members, just um, before uh, chair, can I? Yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not closing yet, Rosemary. Do you want, do you want, be, do you want to? Is that point, Rosemary? Is it do that issue? Is it do with independent panels issue? Is it? No, I can do under business. I, I would yeah. just need to come to. No. Uh, can we go, go no, tell? No, no, uh, under any other business. Yeah. Right. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, I just want to go. Um, okay. Just move to chair a wee second here. I, I just got. Uh, I just seen a message there that uh, Jimmy Jimmy Spratt has pa sadly passed away. Um, and I will say that whenever I joined the family in uh, 2012, Jimmy was the chair of the DRD committee at the time, and I found him to be a, a very fair and impartial and a and a hard working um, MLA who took us who took his role very very seriously, and certainly you know would have. I learned a lot from him being the first chair of a committee I was on. So I'm sure the, the committee would, uh, this committee would, would, would agree that we pass on our sympathy and condolences to the family, you know, um, his loss, this, the loss of Jimmy. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I had a, a appreciate that that's done. I think he was an absolute gentleman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for saying, sir, and thanks for doing that. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, uh, Claire? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, sorry to hear about the, the passing of Jimmy Spratt. I never met him, but obviously he was South Belfast, so I knew of him very well. That's very sad news. Um, for AOB, listen, Chair, I, I raised or uh, questioned um, officials last week about pay COVID payments for the horticulture sector. Um, and we know that the minister has had set aside originally 1.6 million for COVID payments to applicants in the sector and last week we heard that there had only been 10 applications 
and of those 10, two had withdrew because they couldn't um, meet the, the high threshold of evidence that was being asked. But that leaves a substantial underspend in that budget. And is there anything that we can do as a committee in, in trying to make sure that all the horticulture businesses are able to apply and get some sort of payment? Because they sit in a very different place from most other businesses in terms of their stock for this year and their seeding and planting will be their next year's stock, not just profits. And I'm just a wee bit concerned that there's too many being left out. Okay, uh, maybe that's something that we want to forward to the department, uh, Stella, the, the, for the issues that Claire's raised. Uh, I, I'll raise this with the department. Thank I'm you. Happy to there. Very uh, much appreciate it. No problem, Rosemary? Rosemary? Yeah, thank you. My, thank you. Yes. Mine's, mine's also in relation to the horticulture, which Claire was speaking about. Um, some of those horticulture people that have had applications in for some time, they have still not been paid. This is taken for eight applications. It's taken in an exorbitant amount of time. Is there any chance that these can be processed a lot quicker? You know, eight applications sitting two months is a bit much. And if those, if that could be looked at and it's a bit like the fishermen that Patsy always that Patsy brings up. There seems to be a lot of issues or red tape. I don't know what it is to jump through in relation. Well, I know in relation to horticulture there is. And one one other issue I want to bring up. I, I'd be interested in reading the Dero Dero report on the experiment that they done and they carried out in relation to the culling of badgers. Uh, regarding TB, and I'm wondering, is it possible to have that report? Um, yeah, yes, I, 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 would, I would agree with you, Rosemary. That, that would be the, the outcome of the TVR study. The tax test yes. facts was removed. Yeah, yeah, no, the funny I'd be interested the outcome from that as well, because um, I, I recall your predecessor. Tom Elliott and myself and Ian Milne and Alvin Mullen and a few others, we actually went on site to witness that in operation a few years ago. So I've read I've read some of the, the highlights of it, but it'd be interesting to get more details of that. If that was made may that request be put in, yeah. That request can be put in, yes. Yeah. So okay, members. Um Thank you. that was a, that was just, that was a, a very wide range of meeting I thought this morning and I want to thank you all for your your attentiveness and your contributions and uh, and we'll, we'll be I'll be seeing you again here next week and across <laughs> across the chamber maybe during the course of the week so the next meeting will take place on Thursday this day week at 10 o'clock uh, again another virtual uh, meeting streamlined uh, or streamed on the website and uh, we'll just uh, adjourn the meeting at this stage so members all the best there okay all right take care now right. thank you bye, bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland...